Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, hey, welcome to the uh, fourth biennial, sort of, except for COVID delays, uh, the In the Footsteps of Norman McLean Festival. Uh, brief overview of the festival history. We started in 2015, a relatively small event up in Sealy Lake. The idea behind it was to honor uh, otherwise, at that point, not a whole lot of local recognition, Norman McLean, uh, the writer of the original book, A River Runs Through It, uh, and Men in Fire, two great 20th century American novels. <clears throat> and uh, it was a good event. We held it again in 2017. We had, uh, we focused on the movie. We had Tom Skerritt here. We had the executive producer. We had uh, two of Norman's children here. Uh, in 2019, we expanded more into other literature uh, that related to or spun off from uh, Norman and, and the rivers and the Northwest in general. <clears throat> this year, we've taken it a step further. Public lands and sacred ground is the theme here. The, uh, the idea is to recognize the cultural and environmental roles these lands play uh, have played up in the past and how we can, what we need to do to preserve them going forward in the future. We're going to have a whole series of different speakers and panels over the next two days. Uh, the panelists and the speakers represent truly a who's who of contemporary literature of the West. Uh, these individuals have won Academy Awards, Pulitzer Prizes, National Book Awards and other prestigious recognitions uh, of their extraordinary literary achievements. Uh, you're going to enjoy it. Uh, to get started, what I want to do is introduce Velda Shelby, uh, who is going to speak to us about land acknowledgement. Velda is the Director of Economic Development for the Salish and Kootenai tribes up here north of Missoula. And with that simple introduction, I would like to bring in Velda. Kisuk Wilnam Swutmu. Good morning, friends. This region we meet on today is the Aboriginal lands of the Skelihu, the Bitterroot Salish and Callis Bay, the Axmaknik, the Kootenai or Dunaha, the Blackfeet and Shoshone tribes. The Kootenai word for this area is Tuhul Nana, which means small trout. The Aboriginal territory of the Kootenai, Dunaha, span the Rocky Mountain trenches to the headwaters of the Columbia River Basin. My ancestors used to fish gigantic sturgeon and salmon, so they were not impressed with the local fisheries. <laughs> the fur traders who first arrived to this region referred to the canyon north of us as Hell's Gate because the Blackfeet and Pagan used to ambush the Salish and Kootenai people there. And just a few miles west is the site where Governor Stevens met with the chiefs and the emissaries in 1855 to sign the historic Hellgate Treaty. This treaty established the Flathead Indian Reservation, where I reside today at Yakit Patsnitki. This photograph is Nasukin, Chief Inyas Paul Big Knife, <clears throat> whose ex is on the treaty. He was my great, great, great grandfather, Ka'at Smith. In a few weeks, the Missoula County Commissioners will recognize the forced removal of the Bitterroot Salish by dedicating the newly renamed Bear Tracks Bridge, which is right outside here. 
I would like to thank the leaders of this community for their continued recognition of the first peoples of these lands. Husukilkukani, now San Miedki. Thank you for letting me share my perspective today. Dachas. Am I waiting for the John Tester video or is my schedule off? Hello and welcome to the 2022 McLean Festival in Missoula. I want to start by thanking my friends at the McLean Literary Festival for hosting this event and for inviting me to speak with you today. As you all know, this year's festival will focus on contributions of some of the West's greatest authors, like its namesake, Norman McLean a world-renowned writer with deep roots in the treasure state, who's a river run through it, spread the magic of Montana to readers across the globe. McLean and his fellow Western writers have harnessed the beauty of our unique wilderness and natural landscapes, while reminding us of the importance of honoring tribal lands and history. I can't think of a better way to celebrate the state of Montana and to honor the great writers who have drawn their inspiration from what truly is the last best place. And as your senator, it's my job to make sure that it stays that way. A few years back, I stood in Seely Lake, not far from where you are all gathered today, to introduce the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act, a critical bill that would protect thousands of acres of public land and ensure that our kids and grandkids have access to this one-of-a-kind place for decades to come. Since then, we've made huge investments in conservation efforts, critical infrastructure projects, and tribal lands through the American Rescue Plan and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. But we still have more to do. The recent flooding raging through communities across Montana has posed new challenges and serves as a harsh reminder of just how important these investments are in order to protect our public lands and all the folks who cherish it. Public lands are the beating heart of our state. Not only are they home to some of America's most incredible plants and wildlife, but they drive our recreation economy and serve as a gathering place for folks across the state and our country and the world. You can see why so many, great, you can see why so many of America's great writers would be inspired by the magic of Montana. I'm grateful for all the state has to offer, but more importantly, I'm grateful for the opportunity to work and represent folks like you who are here on the ground every day working to preserve and improve public land and sacred ground. We need you now more than ever. Thank you all for having me and for bringing Montana's history to life during these trying times. Enjoy the festival and know that as your senator, my door is always open. John Tester is the man. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to start this morning off uh, with a uh, keynote speaker of renown, Timothy Egan. Tim's resume is stuff of legend. Uh, as the op-ed writer for the New York Times, his articles on politics, the environment, and the American West, uh, consistently are the most widely read of all of the items in the Times. He's been awarded the National Book Award, the Pulitzer Prize. He has written nine books, many of which are bestsellers, several of which have been made at the movies. After Tim's talk, uh, we'll open up the mics to, uh, if you have any questions out here, and uh, with that, I am deeply honored to introduce you to Tim Egan. Well, good morning, everyone. Beautiful, gorgeous, final summer day. Final meaning we finally have a summer day. And you came inside. That's amazing. That's extraordinary. It's so great to be here among fellow friends of the wild and fellow defenders of the wild. 
I just, I'm just humbled to be among these other riders, including people like Terry Tempest Williams, who's going to be your keynoter tomorrow. Uh, I know her only because she's such an evolved soul. When I'm around her, I feel about this small, you know. And thanks to Jenny Rohr and Bill Lombardi for bringing me to the last best place and filling me in a lot of this. Now, um, and for those of you running the marathon tomorrow, congratulations in advance. <laughs> Six o'clock starting time, so get, get, your, uh, get your carbo loading on early. So our topic, overall topic, is the footsteps of Norman McLean. And, you know, I was wondering, can anyone follow the footsteps of Norman McLean without feeling like you're lost in a forest of insecurity and inferiority? This, this giant, now, when I was a New York Times Western correspondent, I traveled at least 50,000 miles a year all over the West and had to write on deadline. And sometimes I'd get stuck trying to write my 800-word news story, and I had an hour to finish it, to post it. I always traveled with my little dog-eared copy of A River Runs Through It. It was always with me. I'd be stuck. I'd open up A River Runs Through It. I'd find a passage of that gin-clear prose, and then I was unstuck. I just need needed to read it for 15 minutes, and it would clear me up. Now, before I start my topic on public land, I want to tell you my favorite Norman McLean story. He was known as some of you may know, for his stubbornness, uh, his ability to hold a grudge, which um, we Irish know as Irish Alzheimer's. Um, <laughs> you forget everything but the grudges. <laughs> now, River Runs Through It was rejected by every major publisher, every major publisher, uh, including most prominently Alfred A. Knopf, then one of the most prominent publishers of all. Uh, there was a line I heard when I was researching Norman McLean that one publisher rejected it saying, sorry, we can't publish this book. It has trees in it. <laughs> now, I'm sad to say that anecdote, which I loved, is not true, as his son John McLean reported in his wonderful memoir, Home Waters. But River Runs Through It was finally published when Norman McLean was 74 years old, a late starter. It was published by University of Chicago Press, and as you know, it was a huge global sensation, ruining all your favorite fishing spots, and the movie continuing to ruin all your favorite fishing spots. Now, for a second book, Alfred A. Knopf, publisher, approached Norman McLean again, then in his late 70s, and said, well, print anything you write. Norman wrote them back and said, you may not know me, I'm Scots-Irish. I never forget anything. <laughs> if you, sir, were the last publisher on earth, and I were the last writer, that would be the end of books. <laughs> and, and that story is true. <laughs> so, uh, on to our topic, public lands in American history. Now, I think most of us, in these really deeply troubled times, would agree that humanity needs a new story. Um, I was at a conference about 20 years ago, a Western conference, and we were trying to come up with something to replace the, what most of us felt were the dated metaphors about the West. We were trying to come up with a story that we felt comfortable with as Westerners, a story that wasn't bullshit, and wasn't just legend, and wasn't just myth. Um, and I'm going to try to make a case this morning that we have that story, we have that shared story, and that shared story is our public lands. Um, but we need to expand it. We need to take in the Native American part of that story, and that's why I really like this year's theme, public lands and sacred ground. You're gonna hear a lot in the next two days from people who know far more about that than I, so let's open it up to that. And first, let me tell you a little bit of the existing story and something about myself is, and what we face in this year of threats, this time of threats to public lands. So growing up in eastern Washington, I came from a family of nine, and we did not have any money. We did not have a summer home. I knew people who had summer homes on Priest Lake, or Flathead Lake, or Hayden Lake, and they were all assholes. Um, 
or at least they seemed that way when they talked about their summer homes. We had nothing. We went camping in a big army surplus canvas tent. And both my parents smoked. <laughs> my mother always told me we were rich. We were rich. We had more than those snot-nosed elites in their summer homes at Priest Lake. We had everything. We had 500 million acres, an area nearly the size of France. We could camp in the National Forest along the Pend Oreille. We could fish in Rock Creek or in the St. Joe River. We had mountain meadows and lakes. We were rich, and our wealth came from a single source, our inheritance as an American citizen. And when I was 19 years old, I hitchhiked across the West with a friend, and I saw in a month's travel so much more of what I hadn't seen before. My buddy and I traveled over a road you all know named Going to the Sun. And we heard stories about another place, a road toward a place called Craters of the Moon. We slept on hard ground in the high wind-raked expanse of Wyoming, and then we thrilled at the sight of our first 14,000 footers in the state of Colorado. When we put up our tents, we were lords of a manner that no monarch could match. Now, a few years ago, I was lucky to stand atop the highest point in the lower 48 states, Mount Whitney in California. And from there, you could look down and see the lowest point in the lower 48 states, which is Death Valley. And nearly all that the eye takes in belongs to you and me. And I had that Woody Guthrie song in my head, this land is your land, this land is my land. I sang it all the way down from that peak. Now, how did this happen? Where did this come from? Was it an accident? Was it written into the Constitution? Was there a series of laws? Well, I'm going to give you, you're going to hear actually several versions over the next couple of days. And like the Norman McLean story, most of them will have the added value of being true. But a big part of it from my perspective, how we got this public land legacy, came from the big burn of 1910 the wildfire that consumed three million acres in a weekend. The area the size of Connecticut burned in less than 38, 36 hours. Now, to me, this was a mythic story. When I was growing up and going on these camping trips, I always heard something about this fire. And you could still see some of the standing charred cedars and a few of the white pine that have bear the marks of the 1910 Big Brum. I was someone who worshipped smoke jumpers. I liked football players, I liked other heroes, but smoke jumpers were something beyond human. Loaded down with 100 pounds worth of gear and diving from an airplane, you know, a few thousand feet above a vertical slope that was aflame, those people were truly heroic. And then as I got to know them as an adult, as a journalist, I realized they were incredible people. Some of them were pursuing master's degrees in medieval history, or you know, playing guitar for tips in bars. They were just really cool folks, and I worshiped them. But as you know, every Native American tribe has a creation myth, a story of origin, of how people came to be. And the Lakota have a saying that a people without history are like wind on the buffalo grass. Well, the Forest Service has its own creation myth, and that is the Big Burn of 1910. Now, before this fire, President Benjamin Harrison had created the first forest reserves early in the 1890s, but there were no foresters. They had reserves, but no foresters, because there was a hostile Congress, and they didn't want people overseeing this, trying to regulate and trying to make sure that it was managed a certain way, and they plunderers and the malefactors of great wealth, as Teddy Roosevelt called them, pretty much had their way with this place. It was a pair of odd ducks, Gifford Pinchot and Teddy Roosevelt, who claims they invented the idea of conservation. They didn't, of course. Many streams fled into that, fed into that river. But it was Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot who took the bully pulpit, who made it political, who made it policy, who took it to the White House and made it a lasting legacy. 
Pinchot was born in 1865. He died in 1945. Born at the end of the Civil War, dies at the end of World War II. And his lifetime sees nearly a third of American history. His family was very, very, in the, very quirky. He was quirky. And in this, the way that these family fortunes happen, the Pinchot family made their fortune clear-cutting the state of Pennsylvania. They then used some of this money to found the Yale School of Forestry, which they cl claim is the first school of forestry. TR, Teddy Roosevelt, was our accidental president. Uh, most of you know the story of what happened to him on Valentine's Day, February 14, 1884, when he was living on the upper, excuse me, just not far from Central Park on West 57th Street in New York City. His mother was living on the second story of this brownstone. His wife, who he was madly in love with, had met at school, had just given birth to their first child. And on Valentine's Day, that day she gave birth, she died. Roosevelt went upstairs to the second floor, and his mother, who had been ill, died on the same day. So he lost his wife, he lost his mother, and he wrote in his diary, this most prolific diarist who was ever to be president, I've held the page in my hand, it's in the Library of Congress, there's a giant, very shaky X written on February 14th, 1884, and beneath that X, Roosevelt wrote, the light has gone out of my life. He gives up his title in the New York legislature. He asks his sister to raise the child, and he moves to the Dakota Territory. And there he takes up as a rancher in a very small cabin, and he has his books. And over about a year, the West heals him. The West makes him whole again. But he has an epiphany. This West that he had imagined was an endless Eden of ungulates, of birds, of fish. This great, bountiful land was being rapidly depleted. He saw it. He finally hunted down a, a bison, and it was, it was like he was sad because the whole thing was depleted. The birds he thought he would see blotting out the sky were not there. So Roosevelt goes back to New York and throws himself into politics and is committed to do something about what he sees as this new nation destroying the land it's taken over. Now he's a governor of New York and he's a reformist. He's not corrupt, which is a rare thing to be governor of New York and not be corrupt. <laughs> he wrote in his diary that not all of the legislators in the New York Assembly were corrupt, but 99% of them were. And they thought, we gotta get rid of this guy. So they put him on the ticket, the presidential ticket, 1900 as vice president. They thought, that'll get him out of New York and we'll never hear from him again. Well, what happens is the president McKinley is shot in Buffalo. Uh, Roosevelt is then hiking in the Appalachians. He's trying to climb, I think, the highest peak in New York. Secret Service goes up, grabs him, hikes down the trail and says, the president's been shot, yet to be on standby. Hangs around for a couple of days. McKinley doesn't die. But Roosevelt goes back up the trail Spends another couple days there. And after eight days of this, McKinley dies. Roosevelt, at age 42, becomes our youngest president. And he brings with him to the White House these ideas that he developed in the Dakotas, these ideas about conservation. And he also brings with him Gifford Pinchot, this quirky individual who had also lost the love of his life, and a woman named Laura Hoodling. And he continued to see her as a ghost and try to summon her, if Pincho did, for about 20 years, which his mother would say, why don't you ever date? Why don't you see anyone? I said, well, I have someone. He would set a chair at the table when he would go to the White House for his ghost. So these, these two individuals, I want to make clear, Pincho claims that he killed a deer with a pistol, and Roosevelt claims that he killed a grizzly bear with a knife. Not sure either of those things are true, but they wanted to preserve animals so they could kill them. I mean, their idea of conservation, they were the Boone and Crockett Club. They were hunters. That's what they wanted to do. They knew their place in the food chain. Now, they also had this thing, Pinch will call it in his diary, a peculiar intimacy. They would go on these long walks along Rock Creek Park, 12 miles sometimes. 
At the end of some of these walks, the President of the United States and his top aide, being Gifford Pinchot, would take off all their clothes and go skinny dipping in the Potomac. Now, I tried to imagine a few years ago what this would be like if Trump and Steve Bannon <laughs> <laughs> went skinny dipping in the Potomac. <laughs> and Trump would say, I don't swim, I don't like this. <laughs> And, and Bannon would sink, you know. <laughs> so anyway, it was on these walks and during this skinny dipping that, that, that Pinchot claims that they came up with the idea of, of conservation. Now, Roosevelt creates the National Wildlife Service. That was one of the first things he did in Florida. He creates a wildlife reserve for pelicans. Um, he makes Pinchot the chief forester, and voila, the National Forest will have foresters. Rangers, starting in 1905. Um, starts to work on making the Grand Canyon a national park. I think it finally became a park in 1916, but he starts the ball rolling. They always framed this, these two rich guys, these two Easterners, these two strange men who were in love with their ghosts, they always framed this conservation as one thing to do for the greater good, but as a class issue, rich against poor, the little guy, that was a word they used, a class issue. As I said, Roosevelt called the wealthy malefactors of great wealth, and Pinchot called them the feudal overlordship. Pinchot's philosophy for forest reserves was the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people in the longest run. As the author John Clayton wrote, and he will be with us on our panel later today, these are democracy's lands, democracy's lands. And the early 20th century progressives frame this as crucial for the average non-rich person to have access. That was the word they used, to have access, a stake in this land. Now, they were blessed with their enemies. It helps in a crusade like this to have good enemies. They had oligarchs, and Roosevelt said he just loved to give them shit. He said, there is not in the world a more ignoble character than the mere money-getting American, insensitive to every duty, regardless of principle, bent only on amassing a fortune. The worst person of all these oligarchs who opposed the public land creation was from right here in Montana, Senator William Clark. Now, back in the days when state legislatures legislators used to pick senators, which was a terrible idea, occasionally gets revived. A person like Clark, who was one of the wealthiest individuals in the land, a copper king, could purchase this office, and he did that. He bribed the Montana legislators openly. He gave them money in this monogrammed envelopes with his name on it, stuffed with you know hundreds of dollars to buy his Senate seat. He promptly then moved and built one of the largest mansions in Manhattan. Not the Manhattan here in Montana, but in the Upper East Side. His mansion had 121 rooms, and it cost the equivalent of $200 million in contemporary dollars. I guess when I was thinking about this today, he's not the first Montana politician to take a presidency out of state and represent the state here. <laughs> Seems to be something of a tradition. <laughs> Here's what one of my favorite authors, Mark Twain, said about your senator, William Clark. He is as rotten a human being as can be found anywhere under the flag. He is the most disgusting creature that this republic has ever produced. Now, he didn't say this because Clark was rich. Twain had nothing against being rich. He himself had lost a fortune and tried to get it back by speaking. He said this because Clark was corrupt. And Clark, the one thing I'll give him, he was openly corrupt. He said, I never bought a man who was not for sale. Now, for our purposes here today, among lovers of public land and defenders of the wild, Clark is known because he loathed the idea of public land. 
He despised the idea of conservation for future generations. Here's what he said, very succinct. Those who succeed us can damn well take care of themselves. And there he framed the struggle. There he framed the struggle. And we have it with us today. The West of possibility, openness, access, or the West of possession, of fencing it, controlling it, owning it, dictating who has access to it. Here we are now, a very troubled, almost first week, I guess, of summer of 2022, with the pandemic still bothering many of us, with new details coming out every day on an insurrection and an attempted coup, with inflation, with fires in the Southwest and California, floods here in Montana and in the Northwest, a Supreme Court that's got Americans at each other's throat. And I know one of the few things that have sustained us and one of the few things that unite us still are these public lands. That's really what defines the modern West. Urban islands, urban islands like Missoula, like Bozeman, like Seattle. I'm, I live in Seattle. 30 minutes from Seattle, I can walk in the Alpine Lakes wilderness, half a million acres of formal wilderness. Urban islands surrounded by public land. Now, that's one reason, by the way, which I, people ask me, I don't consider Texas to be part of the West. Texas is part of the Confederacy. It was a slave-owning state. Also, most importantly, Texas is not a public land state. Try finding public land in Texas. It's difficult. You know, there's a nice national park along the Rio Grande. There's places in the hill country, but for the most part, it's, it's not a place where this land belongs to you and me. Now, back to the big burn for one moment. In that fire, 100 people died. Five towns were removed from the map. I drove by a sign saying Taft. Taft no longer exists, but you can go walk among the ghosts of Taft. Five towns were wiped from the map. Three million acres, as I mentioned earlier, consumed by flame. The Forest Service said, we lost. The fire won. But that fire, by making heroes of those who fought it, a lot of immigrants, a lot of immigrants. I traced in the Big Burn some Italian immigrants back to their home in Italy, this little village where they'd come to America trying to find their fortune. They ended up dying in Idaho in the Big Burn. African-American soldiers, the Buffalo soldiers, who did incredible, incredible job defending some of those towns in the middle of the Big Burn, and by their very presence, doubling the African-American population of Idaho. <laughs> the young forest rangers who had these culture clashes all the time, they were made heroes. So it's, it saved the Forest Service, which Congress was ready to ax Roosevelt was then gone, Taft was president, and Congress was ready to axe it, but it, public, there was such a, uh, an upwelling of public acclaim for these, quote, heroes that it saved the Forest Service. But what happened was there was a huge change in policy. Thereafter, the Forest Service became the fire service, and they tried to put out every fire. Norman McLean called it uh, 1910 on the brain, and they had something called the 10 o'clock rule, where if you were on a fire lookout and you saw a fire that day and you got it down to the district ranger, he had to have that fire put out by 10 o'clock the next day, which seems impossible right now, but that was the, one of the rules that were in effect. One of Pinchot's rangers, they called them little GPs, little Gifford Pinchos, <laughs> was Aldo Leopold, who many of you know from his book, A Sand County Almanac. He took up with the newly established Forest Service in Arizona and New Mexico. He told his fellow rangers to think like a mountain. In 1922, 100 years ago this summer, he promoted an idea. He said, why not manage the Gila National Forest as a wilderness area? A wilderness area. Now, this was a radical idea. It was the first time any country in the world had tried to designate an area not as a playground, not as a scenic magnet, 
but simply for the sake of its wildness. Now think about that. Public land had a worth for some, as something other than utility, something that could be used for something other than industry. Think about it, the politicians did. It took them nearly half a century. But in 1964, Congress passed the Wilderness Act, which recognized the value of preserving, quote, an area where the earth and its community of life are untrammeled by man, where man is a visitor who does not remain. It was bipartisan, by the way, too. The bill passed by strong majority, both members of both major parties. Now, as has been alluded to already, and you'll hear this weekend, all of this land I'm talking about was used by Native Americans. Some was ceded by treaty, but most of it was outright stolen or taken in conquest. Whites only started talking about public land after insisting that natives give up most of their hunting, fishing, and sacred grounds. Now let's talk about this for a moment because it's, it's a really important part of the story. Some time ago I visited Acoma in New Mexico, which is west of Albuquerque. I don't know if any, many of you have seen it. It's a giant rock that lifts up. They call it the Sky City, the Sky City of Acoma. It's extraordinary. Now I grew up as a student of history hearing that St. Augustine, Florida, founded in 1565 by the Spanish, was the oldest continuously inhabited town in the lower, in the continental United States. St. Augustine, Florida, 1565. That's not true. Acoma has been continuously inhabited, and no one disputes this, for at least a thousand years. People have lived atop that rock, even after the Spanish waged war against them and lopped off the foot of the male members of who'd, who'd, uh, who'd had an uprising against them. Akama is at least a thousand years old. Why don't they teach that in our history? What's wrong with teaching that? Are kids going to be offended? Are they going to go home and cry to their mommies because someone told them that there's a city older than St. Augustine, Florida? No, it makes me as a Westerner damn proud. Forget about it, Florida. We have the oldest city here. It's in New Mexico. Suck on it. It's not an offensive thing to say. They don't teach that. I just looked it up again. They still say it's St. Augustine, Florida was the oldest continuously, the first city in the United States. Now, Seattle, where I was born, well, my family on my mother's side is from Butte. Um, they moved to Seattle eventually. Is the largest city in the world, in the world, named for a Native American, that being Chief Seattle of the Duwamish. You know what one of the first things that the Seattle City Council did? They outlawed Chief Seattle's people from living within the city limits of the largest city in the world, what would soon be the largest city in the world, named after a Native American. Now, this is the story. The first people get written out of the story. Now they're getting written back in. I was happy some years ago, as I'm sure some of you have done as well, to tour the Little Bighorn National Monument with a park ranger who was a member of the Crow Nation. Now the Crows, as you students of history know, have a little bit of a nuanced story with that thing because they were Custer's scouts going against the Lakota, their traditional enemy. And some of them lived to tell the story. So, but it was, it was terrific to hear Native American tell that version of what happened on that battle. I was happy to have been, spent three days in magical, otherworldly Canyon de Chez, which I think is more spectacular than the Grand Canyon, which I floated down a few years ago with my son. It's jointly run by the Park Service and the Navajo Nation in the heart of the Navajo Nation, which is bigger than the size of West Virginia. They tell the story. They share the story. There's nothing wrong with it. They, they co-manage it. Now the Interior Department has just announced this week that the newly restored Bears Ears National Monument will be jointly run by the federal government and the tribes who consider much of it to be sacred ground. Here's what a leader of the Zuni Pueblo tribe said. Today we are being invited back to our ancestral homelands to help repair them. 
I want you to remember that word repair because I'm going to come back to it in a moment. Over in Idaho, the Nez Perce have just been given control of a salmon hatchery in Idaho. And here in Montana, as you probably all know, the government finally turned over management of the National Bison Range to the people whose land it's on, the Confederate K Salish and Kootenai. Now, it was native people, after all, Sam Walking Coyote and Michael Pablo, who helped to rescue a small herd of bison in Saskatchewan and brought them to the Flathead Reservation a long time ago that helped us reestablish bison. Our Interior Secretary, whom I've met, Deb Halland, is a native of the Laguna Pueblo. As she tells everyone, she is a 35th generation New Mexican. Now, I was on one of these Western panels a few years ago in uh, Eastern Oregon. This guy, rancher, was on the panel, gets up, grizzled looking guy, cowboy hat. You know, you know, my family's been on this land for five generations. We came here in the 1870s, and this land is ours. And then it comes around to this gentleman who was a Native American. He says, yeah, our people have been here 10,000 years. <laughs> And uh, you want to talk about your five generations. So that's one of the things that Dev Holland does. <laughs> one of the in initiatives of the Interior Department right now is to replace the derogatory word squaw from more than 660 geographic locations on our public land. Holland said, words matter, particularly in our work to make our nation's public lands and waters accessible and welcoming to people of all grounds, all backgrounds. Now there's that word again. It keeps coming up, accessible. The Montana Constitution turns 50 this year. It enshrines access. It stipulates, stipulates, and this is what makes it somewhat of a radical document, quote, a right to a clean and healthful environment. But there are threats. Ladies and gentlemen, there are dire threats. There are lawsuits, there are political deals, there are big money stealth campaigns going on to take the public out of public land management, to take the public out of wildlife management, to take the public out of stream access. I won't go over these because I think you're probably well versed in what's going on there. Now, allow me just one word since I ventured into this territory about politics. Public lands are the basis of an $887 billion recreation industry. You know what is the largest constituency of outdoor lovers? So every year the outdoor retailers do these surveys of people. The largest constituency of outdoor lovers. It's not fishers. It's not hunters, it's not hikers, it's not rafters, it's not mountain bikers, it's not skiers, it's not the NRA. 86 million people watch and photograph wildlife, mainly birds. Now, we used to call them bird watchers, some of them don't like that. But birders, or bird watchers, if organized, would be the most powerful political constituency in the land. 86 million of them. But it's sort of an oxymoron to think of them organized. You know, they're solo. <laughs> you want to be alone in the wild, you know. You don't want to be in a public hearing. You know, maybe you'll take a friend or two friends. But if they were organized, the other threats, average people, longtime ranchers, people getting priced out of the real estate of the West, not just here in Montana, everywhere. Private lands adjacent to public land, which were fought a century ago by private landowners, are now the most valuable real estate in the United States. If you have private land or you're next to a national forest, you're next to a wildlife refuge, you're next to a park, you got it, because no one's can develop behind where you are. Now, unfortunately, the rest of the world has discovered this through the Yellowstone effect. That damn Kevin Costner. <laughs> you know, the Sopranos with a cowboy hat. And all of a sudden, hedge fund managers who could live anywhere 
Said, I'll buy a big piece of the Paradise Valley. Oh, it floods every now and then? I didn't think that happens. Now, there is one greater threat, I'll say in closing here, one existential threat of climate change. One year ago, this week, it was 112 degrees in most of the Pacific Northwest. And more people died under that heat dome in those four days more people by far died than died in the Big Burn. The largest and most destructive fire ever in the history of California happened last year. The largest and most destructive fire ever in the history of Oregon happened last year. The largest and most destructive fire in the history of New Mexico is happening right now. Because of climate change, we live in the year, we live in the time of the year-round wildfire. I was in Boulder, Colorado over Christmas, and I know a lot of Boulderites have been moving to Missoula recently uh, because it's so cheap compared to Boulder. And the area exploded over Christmas. Boom, boom, boom. These fires broke out. It was like my two little grandchildren were watching from the windows of their house in Boulder. It was like Vladimir Putin had just dropped these missiles all over. You could just see the thing going off and people panicked, fled out of the Costco. There were 70 mile an hour winds. 70,000 people were evacuated for a day over Christmas because of a wildfire in Boulder in a week you never expected it to happen. But we live in the age of the year-round fire. We live in the age of the year-round fire. On top of that, and it's all part of the same story, it's important to see your place in time. It's important to see where you are, to step back every now and then and say, where am I? Where am I in this human story? We're in the age of the mega drought right now. They've done these tree ring analyses, which is a good way that scientists can tell previous droughts. And they say there's never been a bigger, greater drought in 1,200 years than the one that's now going on in most of the American West. Last year, this month, I went down to Lake Mead and walked along the cracked, caked floor of the reservoir that backs up the Colorado River and supplies drinking water and irrigation water to 22 million people downstream and saw this horror story. I looked up twice the height of the ceiling of this theater at bathtub rings, the white of where the reservoir had been. I walked along this absolutely caked floor where the mob dumped a couple of bodies, which we're now finding in these canisters, and there was a few sunken boats there, but mostly it was just a dystopian scene. And I thought, you know, we thought we could make an oasis out of the West by backing this river up, but there's something bigger, something bigger that affects all of us. My newspaper, the New York Times, wrote last week about what's happening with the Great Salt Lake. It's absolutely vanishing, and in its wake is dust, dust clouds that have a toxic effect and will absolutely actually kill people, mostly children and the elderly, if these storms move into Salt Lake City and the timing is right, and they don't think there's much they can do about it. All around us, here where we live, I saw it again in the drive over here, we see these ghost forests. Forests that should be needled and green are needled and silver, or needled and red, or without their needles, standing dead timber. In New Mexico last week, there was a windstorm, and some of these 500-year-old trees just went down in a thump, 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 thump. And a Forest Service employee who examined them said what happened was their roots were calcified. They, were no longer, they no longer had any moisture to them. They couldn't cling to the ground. 500-year-old tree should have another couple hundred years in it unless there's no moisture in the ground. That's another one of these things they see in this mega drought. California has 150 million standing dead trees. So despite these hard times, <coughs> I'm an optimist. I cannot get out of bed in the morning of just thinking gloom, doom, and oh my God, the Seattle Mariners will never make the playoffs. <laughs> Which is true, you just have to live with that. 
So what can we do? What can we do? Well, the one thing we could do is humility. Express humility. Gifford Pinchot, at the height of his power and the height of his hubris, thought man could control nature. He wrote an essay that was ran in all the newspapers of America saying that for the first time in human history, man can control wildfire. He wrote this one week before the big burn. He was almost like nature was saying, you want a piece of me? <laughs> man cannot control nature, as we saw in these recent floods. But that doesn't mean we are helpless. No one wants to be left, I had this image, holding the bones of a dead forest, holding the bones of a ghost forest. Everyone in this room, I would guess, loves the outdoors because they initially had a moment in their life. You saw a bunch of turtles sunbathing themselves on a pond on the first warm day. You walked through an old growth forest and it was not just the grandeur and silence and beauty, but you admired the complexity, the biological complexity that allowed things to live on top of each other and moss to be on nurse logs and all, the, all this great diversity of life. A moment where everyone in this room got religion. Now when Teddy Roosevelt was president, we were a nation of 75 million people. And he asked Americans to try to imagine a day, he said there will come a day, we'll all be dead, but there will come a day when we'll be a nation of 200 million people. Well, we're a nation of 330 million people and still counting. But a few people long ago acted out of love for people they would never know, for people they would never see. Their children's children's children's. And it's love, that's what it is. They could see beyond their own lives. Now these are times, and I think it's gonna get worse despite my optimism, <laughs> that try the souls of really good people. I think you all know this last story. It was much cited after the January 6th insurrection by a mob that was trying to overturn an election and hang the vice president. Story of Benjamin Franklin walking out of Independence Hall after the Constitutional Convention of 1787. A woman shouted out to him, Doctor, what have we got? Republic or a monarchy? And Franklin famously responded, a republic if you can keep it. That same sentiment applies to our public land. This democracy is imperiled, unfortunately. It's teetering, unfortunately. And I honestly don't know if democracy will survive another round or two of elections. But a foundation of that democracy, democracy's lands, are not teetering. Let's give them the love and duty and protection they deserve. And I'll close a small bit of advice from long bearded and long dead and a man almost as stubborn, he was Scottish as well, as, John, as Norman MacLean, that being John Muir, who you'll hear much about, good and bad, in the next couple days. Muir wrote a lot, Muir said a lot, but for my money, it was quotes like this. He said, of all the paths you take in life, make sure a few of them are dirt. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I shouldn't pull that out. <laughs> uh, so uh, Tim's open for any questions if anybody has them. Uh, if you do, raise your hand. I'll do my best to spot you. And uh, we'll give you a microphone so that everybody can hear your questions. Here's one right here. Hi. I Hi. 
Um, I'm so happy to be able to thank you personally for writing short Nights of the Shadow Catcher. It's the most beautiful book. And I want you to know that I am responsible personally for at least half of your royalties. <laughs> Somebody chickened out. <laughs> uh, this gentleman down there. Right. Oh, okay. Oh, there we go. Hi, I'm uh, Richard Donovan from Vermont, doing a little bike ride through the region. And my question is, with all the controversy around fire, um, do you are there any? Do you see you know glimmers of hope there? with the way people are do dealing with it or some, some examples or just trying to figure out where we can get to a better place? Thanks. Yeah, um, and you all heard the question about with fires, do you see any hope there and what we're trying to do? I mean, there is some, there's been some congressional action. A fair amount of money has been appropriated for forest thinning. Now, I have some questions about forest thinning because sometimes people use it as a guise to clear old growth. Um, but it also, when it's done right, is a really important thing because, you know, Places need, forests need fire to regenerate. And the other thing that's happening is just on a local level is people have gotten fire smart. If you live in fire country, which is almost all of the West, even the West side of Washington State burns. I mean, the Olympic Peninsula burned last year, and that's a, that's a rainforest. Um, they've gotten fire smart. They realize if you're gonna live there, and I welcome it, you know, clear the area around your house, make sure you have a metal roof, all these things you can do that's, that, that allow you to live in there. But, the thing that I'm less optimistic about is the macro picture. It, I mean, when it was 110 degrees last year, and you know, most of the summer we were choking on smoke, I just felt like, what can I do as an individual? I can't even go outside. I can't take my kids outside, because you know, the smoke was so thick and the heat dome was like bearing down on us. And um, it was the first time I really felt, holy cow, this is, this is like an absolute you know, real threat, not an abstract thing. But I mean, so there's some policy stuff moving in that direction. Um, I also think one thing, I don't think any good thing will come out of the horrible war in Ukraine, but I think one of the things that's happening is there's an acceleration of people getting off Russian oil and gas and realizing, oh my God, you can have incredible solar in a place like Germany, which they already realize, but they're speeding up. And so switch to alternatives, which is what we have to do ultimately to keep this fevered planet from overheating. Hi there. Thanks for that uh, beautiful uh, speech. Um, my question actually ha has some similarities. Um, what do you think is the single most important thing that an individual can do to help public land? Vote. Hey, thanks very much. Um, I want to think with you just a minute about the title, Public Land and Sacred Ground. And as I was listening, I was kind of wondering if the phrase public land has in the past been able to have a pass as kind of a way of talking about whiteness, getting to take things. And so if, if there's a... a uh, um, a Vine Deloria way of thinking, what would it mean to be part of public land now with indigenous inheritance? That's a great question. I'm probably ill-qualified to answer that, but I'm going to be hosting a panel in an hour, which will have a state senator who's a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai, and on his own website lists himself as a fierce advocate of public land. I'll ask him that question. Uh, yes, um, I'm wondering uh, if you could, uh, I know a lot of people from Montana already know this, but 
is the Montana Constitution, you think, uh, is the place to, that is going to help public lands a lot in, the, in Montana? I mean, as written, I think it does. I think it, it lays the foundation for it. But who knows what happens if they start opening it up and opening it up to political pressure from people who don't have the interests of the public and access in mind. But I think as written, it's, you know, it's a pretty strong document. It really holds up. But I worry about, I got, can't use this word, people fooling around with it. It's the same F word, yeah. Um, I, I loved your talk. It brought tears to my eyes. Um, I'm wondering about the influx of people in Montana. I've lived here my whole life. Mm -hmm. And public land. And I don't know if there's enough public land or not for all these people. Used to be able to be spontaneous and go camping and... Um, you can't really do that anymore, and could I have your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying this because I have two millennial-aged children, but I would just blame millennials. Um, <laughs> because they take Instagram pictures of their favorite hikes and then post them, and then, I, I swear to God, I know dozens of places all over the West, mainly in the Cascades where I do most of my hiking, where I, was, I would meet maybe two or three hikers, you know, you have to work to get in there. And now, you know, I have to park a mile from the trailhead because a couple of millennials um, <laughs> took Instagram pictures of this alpine lake that I thought only a few people knew about, and then it's public. So social media has this real effect on public land. It's not written into one of the panels here, the effect of social media on public land, but I wish it was because it's had a huge effect. Um, and, you know... I didn't mention this, but these are the only, I, one of the biggest things going on in the environmental movement right now is restoration. I, I, talk, I quoted this native talking about the healing and maybe we can repair these lands. We aren't making any more of this. The era of setting aside vast wilderness areas or national parks is largely gone. We're going back to look at places that we nearly destroyed, you know, um, Superfund sites or places that were totally locked. I was so, as I often am, am felt so you know, wonderful to drive through the big burn and see that third growth forest has largely come back. So we've got to work at, at repairing and restoring what we have. We ain't making any more of it, and we aren't setting aside any more of it. But also, you know, just lighten up on the Instagram pictures of the really great places, too. I'll take one more, because I'm supposed to sign some books, too, and we've got... A full couple days here. One more quick question. Yeah. Right here. See, over there? Over here. Yeah. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, I have more of a comment uh, just to add to sure. the notion of public lands. I grew up in Sunburst, Montana, eight miles south of the Canadian border within sight of the Rocky Mountain front, about 20 miles to, or excuse me, 80 miles to Glacier Park and a few miles uh, in the shadow of the Sweetgrass Hills. And part of public land is the prairie, yes. the rolling prairies that we often talk about. And those are in the preamble of the state of Montana Constitution. So, and speaking of Irish, my mother was an Irish immigrant, uh, came to this country in 1948, and fell in love with, uh, with the public lands and with the forest. And while it wasn't Belfast Lock, we would oftentimes go over to Glacier Park, and she, was, she felt so good and so comfortable there. And anyway, just a reminder that public lands also include the prairie. I, I really appreciate that reminder. That's the, the, so I wrote a book about the Dust Bowl, and what happened there was really simple. We took the largest native grassland, which had provided sustenance for bison and therefore sustenance for people for thousands of years, and in a generation's time turned it over. I mean, I, in the Dust Bowl, I quoted an Anglo Apache um, lover of horses who, was, who told his kid what was the story of the Dust Bowl, and he did it in just a few words. He said, wrong side up, because they turned the prairie stubble over and it took to the sky. But in writing the Dust Bowl book, I saw that there's areas on the map that say 
national grasslands. And, you know, as a, someone who comes from forests and rivers and mountains, it took some while to get used to it, but that's that healing I'm talking about. That's that restoration, that they have restored some of these grasslands. In some places, people like the Nature Conservancy have put bison back on them. So I agree with you. That was a great sentiment. Anyway, thank you, folks. I really appreciate it. I'm going to make sure I... Are these all yours? Yeah, that's all mine. Okay. I thought I had some. Okay. I don't know, see, I got that. Yeah. If you screw up my stuff. Okay. No, I'm not. I'm not screwing up your stuff. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay. See ya. <laughs> that was uh, something else. Uh, Tim Egg is my new best friend. Sorry, Deb. <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, let's see where we're, all right. We, uh, our next topic uh, is uh, the Glacier Park story. Uh, we have three people here who are giants on this topic. And it'll be a panel discussion. Uh, we'll be moving some chairs up here for them to sit on and move this podium, I believe, out of the way. So while that's going on, let me give you a, uh, a quick rundown of who they are. Uh, Michael Punk, uh, who happens to live in Missoula, uh, he'll be moderating this discussion. Uh, Michael's a writer, an attorney, a consultant, a professor. He's the past U.S. ambassador for the world, to the World Trade Organization, uh, put in place by uh, President Obama. Uh, his books are all bestsellers, and one, The Revenant, became the Academy Award-winning movie starring Leonardo DiCaprio. John Talifer is a graduate of Harvard, a former senior editor of Newsweek, and the author of five books, including All the Great Prizes, winner of the Douglas Dillon Award. His most recent book, Grinnell, uh, has earned the National Outdoor Book Award. And uh, the third member of this panel is Dr. Rosalind LaPierre. Uh, she's an enrolled member of the Blackfeet Tribe. She's a physicist and associate professor of environmental studies at the University of Montana. Uh, she's an award-winning writer and an ethnobotanist. I've never met one before. It's fast. An ethnobotanist studying environmental and religious history of indigenous plants. Uh, her most recent book is Invisible Reality, Storytellers, Storymakers, and the Supernatural World of the Blackfeet. So uh, Tim Egan will be putting it on. Our chairs are in place. Gentlemen and lady, if you could come up. We're ready to roll. Folks hear us? Okay, great. Uh, thank you everybody for being here today. My name is Michael Punk. I've got the honor of moderating this discussion with some really interesting people. Before I get to that, I just want to say thanks to the organizers of the McLean Festival. I think they've done an unbelievable job of putting together a really exciting program and I'm really proud for it to be in our hometown of Missoula. So, big round of applause. And speaking of Missoula, by the way, it's pretty cool that you can exercise your brain in here this morning. And if you want to, you can go outside and run a marathon only about uh, 50 feet from here. So uh, I like that about Missoula. Um, we've got a big topic here, the, the Glacier National Park story. And it comes inside of the context of an even bigger topic, public lands and sacred ground. And that's a lot of territory, uh, both uh, physically and philosophically. And so I'm really excited to have the two people with me today that I have to, to talk about this conversation. And I want to jump into it with a little bit of, of hearing a, a more personal perspective. Um, I want to ask each of you, uh, John and Rosalind, uh, what in your personal and professional background kind of brings you to this topic? What helps provide the context for you? Rosalind, can I start with you? Sure. So first, oh, you can hear me. 
Um, so uh, I grew up on the Blackfeet Reservation. Uh, my family is from the Rocky Mountain Front. So on my dad's side of the family, uh, he uh, is from what is now Augusta, Montana, but he actually grew up out in the country. Um, and uh, my mother is from Heart Butte, Montana. She also grew up in the country. Um, and so I grew up you know, on the uh, Rocky Mountain Front between my two sides of my family. Um, I still live on the Blackfeet Reservation in the summertime. Uh, the minute the school is out here, I drive up um, and I have a couple of different places. I have land on four different places on the Blackfeet Reservation, so I continue to live there. Um, but the, the, one of the other things that I experienced as a young person is my family um, were migrant farm workers. Um, and so when I was growing up, we would go back and forth between different places around the West. So I actually spent a lot of time on the Yakima Reservation, which is where we grow two main products, which is apples and hops. Um, and uh, so I grew up kind of going back and forth between the reservation and just different places around the West. Um, and of course, to me, the Rocky Mountain Front is home. Um, but it's not just been my home, but it's been the home of my family. Um, as Deb Howland says, uh, for 35 generations, I'd say a little bit longer than that, um, but for a very long time. Um, and so uh, as uh, new people have come to, uh, to Montana, um, they have brought different stories with them um, about their experience and, um, and their lives. But we have had stories here as well. And we've had stories um, in this place that's now called Montana um, for thousands of years. And I think that that connection um, that I learned about um, through um, primarily my uh, grandparents um, and who learned it from their grandparents, that those stories continue to be told um, and those are important stories to um, think about when we think about this larger topic um, that we're talking about of public lands um, and sacred ground. So, thank you. A, a quick follow-up on that before turning to John. In your book, um, you're a trained PhD, but you also talk about the 20 years that you spent learning from your, uh, from your grandparents. Compare those types and styles of learning, and what did you draw from each of those? Yeah, so usually when I give a talk um, in like an academic setting, I always acknowledge that I come from two types of knowledge systems, um, and that the academic knowledge system is one knowledge system, but indigenous knowledge is another knowledge system, and, and they're very similar. Um, so um, as was just mentioned, I mean, I uh, apprenticed uh, as an ethnobotanist with my grandmother and my oldest aunt, and it was an apprenticeship. Um, I went to quote unquote class with them. I paid them every single time I talked to them. I paid them. The same way we do in the university system, right? In our university system, our students pay us to learn from eminent um, scholars. And the sa that, that same kind of system exists in indigenous communities too in terms of indigenous knowledge. Indigenous knowledge doesn't just sort of happen um, you just don't kind of learn it on the side. It is trained knowledge that people learn, um, and it's a system where you are exchanging um, information in exchange for uh, uh, some sort of payment. So yeah, so I always acknowledge that I have those two different types of knowledge systems, and I would just argue very similar process of kind of learning, yeah. John, I'm most familiar with uh, your book on the conservationist George, Ber George Berg Grinnell, but tell me about how you came to this broader topic of glacier, uh, public land, sacred ground. Well, um, first of all, it's a great to have a front row seat here because I get to be in the company of people like you, Michael and Rosalind, um, and of course, you all know Michael wrote the first biography of George Bird Grinnell. I'm, uh, I'm just standing on his shoulders today. Um, you can, 35 uh, generations, you can lop a few zeros off of that for me. I've only been in Montana for 30 years. I wrote a biography of George Bird Grinnell who, um, he kept, I, in the previous books I've written, the first one, a biography of Montana's patron saint, Charlie Russell, he was a great friend of Grinnell's. I wrote a book about uh, the Black Hills and Mount Rushmore. 
Grinnell was in the Black Hills with Custer in 1874. He just kept popping up in every piece of American history I looked into, and I realized that no one had taken a, a direct focus on him. So uh, um, that led me to uh, write this book, and then, of course, it opened up um, a whole new understanding and, and self-education on the very thing that's written on the wall here. Grinnell is a, a, a great way, good way to talk about the, um, let's put it this way, the, the, the combined vision and short-sightedness of these two ideas of public land and sacred ground, and he was an embodiment of those. On Grinnell, I want to stick with that for a minute. Can you talk a little bit? Well, uh, I love the historical backstory on a topic like Glacier, which obviously uh, goes back for uh, forever. But talk about uh, Grinnell's experience in the West and how coming out here, Grinnell as a, as a young man impacted his view of the West and the lands that we live in. So first of all, I was born in 1849 in New York. He was a, a guy of privilege, entitlement, um, all the, the stereotypes you would imagine. But uh, he was raised on the estate of John James Audubon in Manhattan Island, so he really uh, inherited the soul and adventure and, and, um, of Audubon. And, and um, Grinnell went on to be the founder of the first Audubon Society. He came west as a scientist with the Custer expedition into the Black Hills. He, um, like me, like so many people here, he came to the west and it blew his mind and he kept coming back. Nearly annually uh, for the rest of his life, died in, in 1938. Um, and so he was imbued with this romantic notion of the West, and he, very realized, he realized very quickly that the West that he loved was being trampled. And the late 19th century was the progressive era. The progressive era was a great period of reform in the big cities, trying to deal with problems like irrigation and corporate greed. And he realized that he could take the conservation movement. He, at his death, he, the New York Times called him the father of American conservation. Sorry, T.R. Um, and bring that, bring conservation, bring environmentalism into the conversation of a reform in this country. Um, so his story goes from being wide-eyed young, young boy at the age as a Yale graduate coming out into the American West and, um, and then realizing that activism was the only thing that was going to change it. And unlike someone like John Muir, who was a, a, a wonderful writer and, and uh, almost a high priest of the conservation movement, Grinnell was the, one of the first guys who saw what was going and went back and went to Washington and tried to pass laws and use the bully pulpit of his own publication, a publication called Forest and Stream, to really advocate for specific um, things like um, uh, wild game preserves and national parks. Um, and Glacier became his baby, and we can talk about that. So before we get to that, I want to uh, turn back to you, Rosalind, and uh, Tim talked about the year 1910 and the Great Fire, and I was, it, it uh, tripped a, a flag in my mind because in your book, 1910 is a very significant year as well. But tell us why that is an important kind of milestone for you. So yeah, so for those of you who um, get an opportunity to um, uh, read my work, I use 1910 as kind of a fence post um, because it is a time before my grandparents are born. And I wanted to tell this story, because my book is a, is a book about uh, stories. Um, it's a, and so I wanted to tell the story of my grandparents and their upbringing and what they learned and how they learned it. But I wanted to tell it from the standpoint of like the year before they were born, 
right? So the year before they were born is 1910. And so I wanted to sort of set the stage of like, what's going on in 1910 on the Blackfeet reservation um, that they are being born into? So there's lots of things that happened in 1910 um, just in kind of Montana history, Rocky Mountain West history. One of them is, of course, the big burn happens. Um, the other thing that happens uh, nearby us, of course, is the creation of Glacier National Park. Um, but then there are a lot of other different um, things that are occurring. Um, there, at that time period as well, there are a lot of people from museums, so a lot of anthropologists and ethnologists who are coming out to reservation communities and who are recording people's stories because they're really interested and, in, well, at the time they're thinking, you know, this is kind of the end of Native peoples. Um, 1910 is about 25 years after the end of the bison. So an entire generation has been born and lived on a reservation, having never um, met a bison, um, never killed a bison, et cetera. And so there were museums um, that were interested in learning the stories of what one ethnographer called the Buffalo people, um, but people who lived before that. So during that 1910 um, time period, we had even people like Curtis came back um, to Montana to, to re-interview and re-photograph people. Um, we had the Bureau of American Ethnography, which is part of the Smithsonian, sent out researchers to record the Blackfeet language because they thought it was going to end. Um, there were people um, from uh, the University of Pennsylvania who came out. I mean, there were just like folks from everywhere that came to the Blackfeet Reservation to try and record these stories and to record the history and to record the language of the Blackfeet because they thought they were going to to end at the exact same time that Glacier Park is getting created and the Great Northern is hiring native people to, to quote unquote, dress up like Indians um, at, to, to be part of the sales um, and, and the promotion of the park. So there's kind of these weird dynamics that are all occurring at the same time in 1910. Yeah. I start to say I want to drill down a little bit more on Glacier, but I think that's maybe not the right metaphor for, uh, for today. <laughs> Um, um, I want to I want to dive deeper on on Glacier, um, uh, and I'll admit uh, uh, I was introduced as an expert on Glacier, and I'm not. So I'm happy to be sitting with the two of you today. I do know a little bit more about Yellowstone, and there's a there's a part of the of the birth of Yellowstone that I want to mention because I think it's relevant to something we've discussed. Yellowstone was was born, I believe, in 1872. And there were certainly some people of great vision in terms of uh, wanting to uh, protect the national resource as a national treasure. But really the reason Yellowstone was born in 1872 is because not of that presence of beauty, but rather the absence of what was quote unquote viewed as any economic value. That's what created the political constituency that created the legislation that created the park. And I wanna ask you about that and then follow up with John. Uh, you've talked about the 15 years before 1910, what was happening in Glacier. What, what was that, and how do you uh, view that in terms of how you think about Glacier today? Yeah, so um, the area that is now Glacier National Park um, was uh, half Blackfeet territory and then half, on this other side, um, Kootenai uh, territory. Um, and so in 18... Uh, 95, uh, George Bird Grinnell brokered a couple of different treaties. One was for the Rockies um, with the Blackfeet and one was with the Little Rockies um, with the Nakoda and the Grovan peoples. Um, they were both uh, similar treaties. In fact, I think they're word for word, practically the same treaty, um, where they're, uh, uh, the United States government is asking the tribe to cede this territory um, in exchange for um, the same sorts of things, but, in, but what was the U.S. government was interested in was um, mineral wealth. And so in both places, the Rockies and the Little Rockies, there was an effort to search for gold, um, silver, copper, the same sorts of things that we find in other parts of Montana, right? So between 1895, uh, when the agreement was signed, to 1910, when that area became Glacier National Park, um, it was, you know, hundreds of uh, miners came to search 
uh, for mineral wealth. Um, and so there was kind of this ongoing effort to um, look for um, something of value. And in the good fortune uh, uh, of what happened on the Rockies was that nothing was found, right? And that's why it then later, and John can tell the story better than me, became Glacier National Park. The exact opposite happened with the Little Rockies. Um, for those of you who are from Montana, we know the story of Landusky and Zortman, Montana, and what has happened there. Um, that is a super fun site, right? It is a place now that because they found gold there, um, there has been ongoing mining for over a century, and there have been um, uh, nefarious ways of, you know, uh, of doing mining there that it has become a very polluted site and now a site that um, is under some remediation but is continued to have mining there. The exact opposite stories happened in both of these places where one is now completely polluted um, and uh, really forever and one is a protected site. Both treaties brokered by the same person um, and both having a similar kind of beginning story but a different end story. So I think I'll end there. So John, can you talk about that a little bit from your perspective and having done the, the work and research you've done on Grinnell? Um, well, I couldn't begin to convey here the, the range and dynamism and energy of Grinnell's life, but the, the glacier part is in, in a nutshell. Uh, Grinnell came out to Montana, uh, the northwestern Montana, what would become Glacier in the 1880s, and he thought he'd found the last best place, truly. He thought that all of the West had been uh, trodden by uh, white explorers, and he, he found this place. He, he envisioned it as a peopleless place. He was told that the Native Americans were actually afraid of the, um, what was the crown of the continent, and the Walden Lakes, which are the St. Mary's Lake. And he thought, well, this is tabula rasa. And he had been in the Black Hills in the 1870s. He saw what miners were doing there. This was uh, sacred ground, and it was also ground that would belong to the to this Sioux people by by treaty, by act of Congress. He had then uh, later gone into Yellowstone, one of the first guys into Yellowstone as a scientist, 1875, and he saw as he came down the Yellowstone Valley that there had been how many thousands of elk had been killed. He already saw the tourists were, were, were chopping up the, the geyser formations and, the, and uh, commercial interests were going in. He, he saw national parks. Remember, Yellowstone in 1872 was a national park, but nobody really had defined what it was. The, the original uh, organic act said it was a pleasure and ground. Grinnell saw national parks as places where people uh, should tread lightly. He really saw them more as wildlife preserves. And that's what he first, uh, in his diary in 1891, uh, saw when he came into the east side of the Rocky Mountain Front, which was Blackfeet country. He had The railroad had just come in, um, was coming in, and then it was completed in 1895. And along with that, then came the copper miners. And Grinnell saw, oh my God, he had just spent the last 10 years uh, pretty much hewing to this no notion that the Blackfeet didn't like to spend time there and that he could name everything there, that it was all unnamed, that there were no pre-existing names. And um, he said, and it wrote in his diary, this would be great if it could be a national park. Um, four years later, uh, when he was appointed to the commission, the, the railroad had completed. With that, we brought in miners, and he thought, uh-oh, Black Hills, Yellowstone, what he'd known it, it was happening to the Nez Perce in and, and Idaho. He said, we've got to do something to preserve this. This goes back to what I was saying. So he had a vision. He had a vision for conservation, for preservation, and he also had a short-sightedness, a blindness, a, a Anglo-European centric view of it. Um, and that created a collision. So in 1895, he very ambivalently, reluctantly agreed to serve on a commission. Only he said if he could speak for his Blackfeet friends amongst the other white commissioners and try to get them the best deal. The Blackfeet had been 
once again had been dragged to the negotiating table through starvation and defeat. Um, there wasn't any real doubt that this, this land with so-called ceded strip was going to be taken from them um, by the U.S. government. It was just what sort of price they could get for them. It was a, it was a very, very um, awkward situation. And, um, and it was not, uh, uh, nobody, was, nobody was going to, uh, um, the Blackfeet were not going to win. It was just how much uh, they could get out of it, uh, of this bad deal. And Grinnell negotiated this um, terms of this treaty that said, okay, we're going to buy uh, the so-called ceded strip for a million and a half dollars, basically from where the railroad comes through to the south all the way up to um, the top of the National Park Pass, right through the middle of Chief Mountain. And he said, but the Blackfeet need to have access, will we'll have access to graze, to hunt, to fish, to visit these traditional lands, so long as this land is public land. Now, I wonder if either of you know, or if you know, Rosalind, this is the, the question that I have, is that isn't a national park, isn't a national park, uh, park public land? Sacred ground, public land. In, in 1910, when Glacier became a national park, all of a sudden, the Blackfeet were forbidden uh, to do all these things in the original agreement. Um, to me, that's an, a question that I didn't answer in my research, and I wonder if you know the answer to that question. So I'm, I'm sure there's somebody in the audience who knows the answer to this question. <laughs> um, public land is defined differently if it's a national park uh, versus other types of public land. That's so a fairly thin uh, parsing of the word public lands. Um, so, so there are federal laws of what you can and cannot do on, on, on uh, national park lands. And one of the things that the federal government has argued, um, and again, um, hopefully Shane can answer this question later, because um, he's an attorney, uh, that the U.S. government argues that um, kind of treaties are null and void when it comes to national parks. Uh, versus other public lands. So what has been agreed upon in a treaty, it still stands if it's quote unquote public land, but not if it's a national park. I want to ask a follow up to that. I don't, uh, and I'm, uh, it's been a long time since I've been a lawyer, so I'll plead ignorance on that. Uh, but I want to ask you something that's kind of related to that. There's two terms on the screen up there, public land and sacred ground. Uh, What's the difference between those two from, from your perspective? Oh, that's a good question. I haven't even thought about that. Um, so yeah, I, I, it, so one is a legal term, I'll say that. Well, actually, kind of they're both legal terms now, today, in kind of modern society. Um, there is a definition for sacred and sacred land in the in, uh, US government. Uh, and um, so one, I'd say they're both legal terms now that we use. Um, but I think one of the things to think about um, is um, to remind ourselves, and this was kind of brought up at the end of um, uh, Tim Egan's um, uh, uh, presentation earlier, which is that no matter where you are, you're on indigenous land, right? And no matter where you are, um, indigenous people have been here for thousands of years. And so oftentimes when we think of public land, or we think of quote unquote, I don't like using the word wilderness because I think that's a misnomer term, um, wilderness areas, that indigenous people have been living, one, living there for thousands of years, um, managing that landscape for thousands of years, stewarding it, changing it, adapting it, um, et cetera. So when Americans came, um, including Grinnell, and he's looking at this place saying, wow, um, untouched, amazing place, not untouched, Amazing, yes, because indigenous people have been there managing it for thousands of years. That's why it's amazing. Um, but untouched, no. Um, so when we think of public lands today and we think of them as this kind of pristine, we kind of have to erase that kind of language um, that we've been using for 100 years just kind of out of our minds. Be and we have to replace it um, with thinking of it as a different place, thinking of it as places that people have lived in 
used, managed, stewarded, um, recreated, adapted, you know, wh whatever those words are, wilderness is not one of them because there's no place in North America that's a wilderness um, at all because indigenous people have been here for more than 30,000 years. Um, that's the latest scientific data. They've probably been here longer. Can, can we just agree that everything is sacred land and some of it is public? Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, so, I think that's the problem with, with Glacier in a nutshell. Um, <laughs> uh, we'll solve that one, so check. Uh, I, I love how uh, Tim ended up on a hopeful note in his opening comments, and I think some of these topics sometimes can feel uh, so overwhelming that it can be paralyzing. And I don't know all about you, about all of you, but I spend way too much time doom scrolling uh, of late. Uh, and I want to ask, uh, one of my hopes is that we learn from history and that each generation gets, gets better. Uh, John, I want to ask you, uh, from your perspective, if George Bird Grinnell were alive today and uh, a, a century wiser, um, what might he do differently uh, from your perspective? Um, for, well, for one thing, he, well, he probably wouldn't do much more different. He was, a, he was such an active campaigner for um, wildlife protection. He helped create the migratory uh, bird protection law that became the real precedent, the germ of the Endangered Species Act later on. Uh, at the end of his life, he, he, came, he loved to come out. He called Glacier National Park his park. Glacier, he named, Glacier, Grinnell Glacier, he called it my glacier. Grinnell Point is the name for him. He really had an uh, uh, egotistical proprietary <laughs> sense of owner, ownership there. But he deserves credit. Um, glacier National Park might be a far different place without him. But at the end of his life, he would go there, he would stay at Many Glacier Hotel, and he'd walk the trails. He used to uh, go by himself with a pack horse. The rangers wouldn't let him go off by himself. And he just lamented it, that it was being loved to death. That was 100 years ago in the 1920s. He envisioned, starting with Yellowstone and carrying on to Glacier, he really saw uh, and you know, you wrote about this in your book, about Yellowstone, your book on, on Grinnell, that, that he saw a national park first and foremost, a place to be uh, as a wildlife preserve. And now they're being loved to death. Um, and I think his big regret is that there weren't more, you know, look, now in it's alternate days license plates in a national park. Well, if it's come to that, that's love to death as far as I'm concerned. And I think what he would do today is say, let's keep it wild, you know. Um, I think he wasn't, uh, you know, he, was a, he wasn't a radical, but the idea of wilderness appealed to him. He was a very early correspondent with Aldo Leopold. Leopold's idea of wilderness was we can't turn all national forests into wildlife preserves, but we can take areas within the public lands and national forests and make them uh, protected wildlife areas. That was the real seed of what then became wilderness. I think Grinnell would have, would have embraced wilderness, and I personally wish we had vast areas that were people couldn't go to at all. So, Rosalind, this is a big burden to put on you. Uh, the, both the last word and the, uh, I'm curious as to what makes you hopeful when you look at the, the complicated landscape today. So, I mean, so I come from a different community. So, I mean, I'm ho one of the things I'm really hopeful about is, you know, there are a lot of young indigenous people who are really interested in revitalizing their relationship with the natural world, um, relearning um, uh, old traditions and uh, becoming reconnected um, in both old and new ways um, to the natural world. 
Um, one of the things that I would say that indigenous people have a different idea about the way that we interact with the natural world, and ours is not that we separate it from human society, but that we immerse ourselves as humans in the natural world. And so just that idea of kind of separating, separation, and um, again, kind of that use of the word quote unquote wilderness, kind of a place separate from humans, is very foreign to indigenous people. Um, and it's really hard for us to kind of wrap our heads around that because um, our relationship with the natural world is really different, and ours is that you interact with the natural world and that you immerse yourself in it, um, but that you also, again, kind of using those same words of like manage and steward it, um, uh, indigenous people don't have a problem with going out and hunting, going out and harvesting, going out and using the landscape, um, because that's what it's there for. Um, and, but at the same time, um, in those practices of use is also a practice of stewardship and long-term stewardship. And what, again, what folks like Grinnell saw when they came out, he did not see untouched wilderness, he saw the exact opposite. He saw touched wilderness, right? Um, and that's a really different um, kind of thing to wrap your head around, and I think as the conversation continues for the next two days, is really start flipping those words um, that we're using and thinking about when we talk about public lands um, or when we talk about sacred ground. That for indigenous people, these are places that we live in. Um, it's not places that are, we, that are separate from us. So. so this is a huge topic. It's a huge topic. It's going to be a fun, ongoing conversation uh, over the rest of the, of the festival. Uh, please join me in thanking John and Rosalind for pushing the conversation forward. Thanks a lot. I'll have to tell you that crows were horse people. Each horse has a role to play you know, in, in, in people's lives. So one buffalo pony would be trained to put the buffalo down. The other horse is, is a war pony. They never touch it except for war. Yeah. And it's a really courageous horse and he's very respected, it's just like a warrior. Every young crow like myself when I was growing up, we always, we grew up on horses. It was just so natural. Okay, looks like everybody's settling down. That's good. <clears throat> We're now going to move on. I've been told to make sure everybody settles down and shuts up so we can. <laughs> so they told me to say that. I wouldn't have said that myself. Okay. We're now going to move on to our next discussion. It's entitled This America of Ours. And uh, Tim Egan, who I believe you still remember who he was. Uh, he'll grace our stage once more as the moderator of this discussion. We have three participants in addition to Tim that'll be involved in it. Can I have quiet, please? Uh, <coughs> Shane Morgeau, uh, he's a graduate of the University of Montana. Uh, he has both a bachelor's degree and a degree in law. Uh, Shane was elected to the Montana House of Representatives in 2017, and he's now a member of the uh, Senate in the Montana legislature. He's a member of the Salish and Kootenai tribe and was recently involved in the historic transfer of the National Bison Range uh, to tribal management. Good deal, I like that. <clears throat> John Clayton, he has authored a number of books. Uh, his most recent, or most pertinent uh, to this weekend is Natural Rivals, John Muir, Gifford Pinchot, and the creation of America's public lands. He's a graduate of Williams College and has lived in Montana for the past 32 years. Third member is Nate Schweber. Uh, Nate is gonna be sitting in the chair on my left with the pink boa on it. 
uh, that was just recently delivered by one of his teachers from Hellgate High School. He's a, he's a Missoula person and uh, another friend who basically wanted to say, even though he now lives in Brooklyn, his memory is not faded, and he's apparently a kind of a crazy guy. Anyway, <laughs> so he's a freelance journalist who graduated from the University of Montana in 2001. He lives in Brooklyn, and his work regularly appears in the New York Times. He has written for Rolling Stone, no surprise there, uh, Al Jazeera America, Anthony Bourdain's Explore Parts Unknown, and Trout Magazine. His latest book, the, This America of Ours, The Forgotten Fight to Save the Wild, will be released in just a few weeks. His articles have won numerous awards, including a share of a Pulitzer Prize. So with that, I would ask Tim Egan to bring the group out on stage. Hey, here we are. And Nate, you can do whatever you want with that pink boa. Thanks for saving it for me. Well, welcome again, and thank you all for staying. I mean, with every passing minute of this day, it's tempting to stay outside. So thank you all for doing this. We've got a terrific panel here. Um, boy, I hope we can get everything in, because there's some great, great minds here. I want to start with something that uh, John wrote, and get everyone here to try to address this. You talked about, um, in your book, John, that people are so passionate about public lands. You say they're not f necessarily fighting over acreage, but over a relationship. You said it's almost spiritual. Can each of you weigh in on that, and see if you agree or what you think about that? Do you want me to start since sure. I... Sure. Since you wrote it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for, for quoting from my book in, in your uh, main speech. And the, the context of that was that, you know, we think of public lands as nature's lands because we do so much recreating and interacting with nature um, in national forests, national parks, etc. But what's really remarkable about them is that they are democracies lands, that they are held collectively by our government, and we get to decide what is done with them. Um, and so that process can be difficult, but it's, it's an expression of our values, an expression often of our spirituality. So that's what I was trying to get at with that, and maybe you guys disagree. The only thing I could add to that is that it goes back to the idea that James Madison had about freedom and democracy itself, that the more people with a stake in something, the greater the base. He thought of it as like a pyramid. The more people with a stake in something, the broader the base uh, of that pyramid, the more secure that pyramid is. And so that was the idea of public lands, that the more people that have a stake in it, the safer that they will be. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think for me as, as a native person who grew up, you know, on the Flathead Reservation, um, that was, you know, really how I connected and disconnected from things, right? It was, it was a place where I, um, you know, I, I learned about things about myself, I learned life lessons, um, and I think uh, those are important things that, that we all take in um, in appreciating public lands. Um, I think we, we look at it sometimes differently. You know, I, I go and walk around here and I, and I see people bird watching, taking photos of bird watching, right? And, and I always get nervous about interrupting somebody during, you know, in the middle of a photo or something to say hi. But, um, you know, for me, it was always the lessons that um, I got from my dad um, and my family growing up and hunting, things that, the tools he gave me. So I think... Um, I would agree with all those things, and I, and I think it's just really, um, for, for so many of us, it's this deep, deep connection that connects us to um, wildlife and our natural resources. So, Senator Morgeau, I'm going to stay with you for a minute. I was asked at the end of my presentation a question about, um, it, and I'll just paraphrase it, Aren't, isn't this idea of public lands kind of a white European construct, and how do we, you know, how do we blend Native American views into this, and I'm paraphrasing the question. 
I said, I didn't feel that qualified to answer it, but I promised the audience I would ask you. So um, I'm, I'm getting rid of my responsibility and handing it off to you. Well, I'd like to hear your view on that, too. Um, I'm kidding. I, you know, I, for me, I, I think that segues well into my last comment, right? I think um, as Native people, we're, we're nomadic. We, we had cultural connections, this mutual respect for wildlife and, and our lands and resources. Um, we, we shifted around when the CSKT um, entered into the treaty in 1855, the Hellgate Treaty, um, signed in Council Grove State Park, um, part of my district, Senate district, actually. Um, but at that time, our Aboriginal territory was over 20 million acres here in, in the region, right? And so that shows you know, that we moved around with this, this mindset of respecting the land and resources, allowing things to reset, not putting too much pressure on things. Uh, to allow things to, to recoup and naturally regenerate for, for us in perpetuity. And so um, for us, we've always had this, uh, you know, there's this reciprocity um, that I've always been taught that, you know, we, we have a responsibility to, to protect uh, wildlife and, and our resources um, because they were put here for us. They were put here for us to, to enjoy in whatever way, you know, you enjoy them, but um, for us, the, you know, bison is a classic example, and I'll, obviously that's what a lot of my focus will be um, in my, my talk here in a minute, but bison's a classic example. They're woven into our DNA, and um, we've always believed we have a responsibility to protect them in perpetuity. Um, I'm going to go to Nate for a second. Nate, you've got an upcoming book on um, Bernard DeVoto and his wife, Avis, and... Um, Perhaps somewhat forgotten now. He's not really on the Mount Rushmore of American conservation. But uh, I, I want to ask you this question. Now, you're, you're a Montana boy, right? Yes, Missoula, as a but, matter of fact. But you're, you live in Brooklyn now, is that right? That's true, yes. Okay, and I'm not going to hold that against you. Um, <laughs> but I, I just have this question. You know, you look, I, I mentioned Gifford Pinchot, raised in a castle in Pennsylvania. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Manhattan boy. Um, FDR, here, Manhattan, right, exactly. George Bird, Grinnell, Brooklyn. So, I mean, what is it about Easterners that seem to cut to the chase more quickly on what public lands mean than, than Westerners? And isn't, is there a cultural conflict there? Uh, well, Bernard DeVoto certainly talked a lot about the cultural conflict. You know, his thought about it was that Easterners had so long plundered the natural resources from the West. There was a series of resource raids that marked the, quote, conquest of the West. Furs, gold, timber, grazing range. And it was Easterners, who were called traitors to their classes, both Presidents Roosevelt, that had this idea of public lands that was to stop the raids, to keep the natural resources of the West in the West, that by stopping the monopolization, stopping these plunder raids, that would keep the natural resources in the West for the use of the people of the West, all the people of the West. So it was these Easterners, again, traitors to their classes, they were called, who came up with that idea. Uh, John, you, I, I believe Mir, John Muir plays a pretty important part in your book. Uh, I think it was last year, the Sierra Club, which was founded by, co-founded by Muir, started a re-examination of John Muir's legacy, saying there was hints that he, you know, I don't like to throw this term around, but the, his racial attitudes were less than progressive by our standards. Um, how would you view the re-examination of John Muir right now through that prism? I tend to think of it as a reexamination of racism, mm -hmm. that Muir, wa Muir had typical views for his era, maybe even slightly progressive views for his era, but it was an incredibly racist era. And nowadays, we have a broader, tighter, better view of uh, what it means to be racist or racially insensitive. And Muir, along with 99% of the people who lived in his era, don't live up to that. Um, and so uh, the Sierra Club is sort of stuck in a difficult situation. They need to honor today's values. Uh, they need to, to say that uh, the, the values that existed at the time of their founding were wrong. Um, and yet that leads to them 
denouncing their founder, which uh, infuriates some of I mean, their members. I mean, does this mean John Muir is going to get canceled? Um, <laughs> as I was interacting with, uh, with fans of, of Muir within the Sierra Club last summer, they, they were feeling like he was already being canceled. Um, and to me, the issue of, uh, of cancellation is, you know, it, it, it's sort of irrelevant. L let's honor the man for the good he did. Let's acknowledge that he was not perfect, that he certainly was not perfect by our standards. Um, and let's try and change his vision to uh, fit the values we have today. And historians have a thing they call, call it presentism, where we apply our values to former heroes. And you know, through the modern prism, most people don't live up to that. Either you want to join on that issue at all? Well, uh, I mean, certainly Bernard DeVoto was somebody that was accused of not being as evolved as he should have been, especially on issues of indigenous sovereignty. Um, but, you know, uh, one of the things that, you know, I think we saw with, again, people like Theodore Roosevelt, as they got older and they learned more, they evolved. You know, Theodore Roosevelt, when he was a young man in the Dakotas, said some really awful stuff about Native Americans. But by 1906, he was signing the Antiquities Act to protect places of special indigenous heritage. And Bernard DeVoto, he also, as he, when he was a younger guy, he grew up in, in Ogden, Utah. He was born in 1897. He didn't grow up with incredibly progressive views. But as he learned more about public lands, as he learned more about the West, he started doing things like sponsoring the American Indian College Fund, defending the Antiquities Act. So he evolved too. And I think that's something that we see with even John Muir as a guy who did that too. The great thing about great men and women is that they learn through their, through their lives. And I think if Muir or Grinnell or DeVoto were alive today, they might be willing to embrace some of the changes that we're experiencing. Yeah, I mean, I, to just to add on to that, I think, um, so what I'm hearing is you can teach an old dog new tricks. And so, um, but, you know, what I would say is, you know, it's evidenced by a lot of the policy errors with tribes too, you know, um, with Theodore Roosevelt and, and some of the other folks uh, and some of the, the actions they took, you know, for example, the bison range when it was carved out, um, you know, at the time that was part of the, the reservation, it was, you know, 18,000. Uh, 700, uh, roughly 700 acres. Um, and, you know, for the tribes, we had really mixed feelings about that because we've seen so many policies intended to oppress Indian people for so long, um, including uh, with our, our, our wildlife and our, our lands, right? And an attempt to really, you know, get rid of us at one point. And then, you know, we, we saw changes throughout time on like, well, we're not getting rid of them. I guess we, we have to figure out a way to, um, you know, give them uh, some autonomy to, to run their own governments. But, you know, the bison range in a way was, was, we had mixed feelings about because at the time we brought bison back, bison that our, our people had uh, worked so hard to um, save from extinction while they're on the brink of extinction. But at the same time, carving out, you know, almost 19,000 acres right in the heart of our reservation was, was a tough thing to swallow. Um, and adding you know salt to the wound there was we were we we were told we had um were really not indians weren't really allowed to be there right at the time so um so getting that land back kind of br brought things full circle but i think the policies my, my larger point is that the policies are really um self-evident when we talk about um you know what we were doing in this country to, to keep people down or to get rid of people um I'm, we're a little bit change the rhythm here for a few minutes. John Clayton wants to show some pictures from Red Lodge, where he's from. And I'm going to leave it up to you to, to do the running commentary of this. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Tim. Uh, as, as thrilling as it is to be in conversation uh, with a hero of mine like yourself, uh, the organizers did ask all of us to prepare some stuff. And so we've got some slides, which uh, now hopefully we'll be able to show. Um, I live in Red Lodge, so here's a video that I uh, shot last Oops, that I shot last week, and okay, the video portion's not working, but um, I want to be the first to make this joke. Um, I thought Norman McLean wrote A River Runs Through It as figurative language. Um, th this is the alley behind my house, and uh, during the floods last week, it turns out it was um, 
a river was running through it. So public lands, um, most of us in this audience are familiar with public lands, not only national parks, but also national forests, BLM lands, wildlife refuges, et cetera. The unique thing about public lands is that they are collectively permanently owned in commons by our democratic government. They're often referred to as a birthright, and I think Tim used similar language in, in, his, uh, in his speech, something that we have inherited from our uh, for previous generations and we need to hold for, for subsequent generations. But where did they come from? Right? They're not in the Constitution. Uh, they're not outlawed by the Constitution. I don't think the Supreme Court will be taking them away from us anytime soon. Don't, don't um, count on it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but public lands um, really evolved um, and here's a map of, of public lands, troublingly including Indian reservations in red as part of public lands, and some of the activities that we pursue on them in various forms of nature. And here's uh, Donald Trump signing the Bears Ears Declaration. Regardless of what you think of that politically, it was a big deal because it was an opportunity for America to consider changing its attitude towards public lands. Um, Public lands, it, 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 Tim's talk about stories was so wonderful. Every great idea has an origin story. Every software company was founded in somebody's garage, right? And so um, national parks, some of us may know the origin story in Yellowstone in 1870 with Cornelius Hedges suggesting that rather than filing homestead claims um, on specific places, they should... Uh, uh, go ahead and have these parks held collectively. This is an, Im uh, an image of a recreation of that scene in the 1950s. Uh, Tim told a great origin story for national forests, but as he mentioned, uh, the actual first forest reserves were, uh, happened in 1891 under Benjamin Harrison. Many of us in Mount Montana know that Yellowstone was the first national park who knows where the first national forest was? Turns out it was next to Yellowstone, the Yellowstone, Tim, the Yellowstone Park Timberland Reserve, 1891, Benjamin Harrison. Why don't we have more of an origin story for the broader concept? The, it, Timberland Reserve, it was not yet a national forest. Why don't we have a, a, an origin story for public lands in general? And so that's what I tried to do in Natural Rivals was talk about uh, an origin story for the idea of public lands. And it happens to be set uh, nearby here in, in Glacier um, at Lake McDonald uh, in 1896 when there were some of these struggles that Tim alluded to about national forests. And one of the great things about uh, that scene in 1896 in Glacier was that uh, John Muir and Gifford Pinchot were both there camped on the side of the lake. And Muir and Pinchot have come to stand for two conflicting environmental philosophies, preservation, um, visit nature, worship nature, learn from nature, versus conservation. Use nature, respect nature, use its resources, respect and manage uh, nature. And indeed, these are sort of different ways of thinking about how to uh, approach uh, people's relationship to nature. And so preservation, which has tended to, to rule the national parks, is about let's not touch this stuff because we're going to mess it up. Um, because nature is good where people are bad. And that whole dichotomy that, uh, that maybe is sort of a white concept, um, that people are not part, part of nature, they may ruin it is conflicted against uh, conservation, which has tended to rule the national forest, which is about sustainability, another hot word reflecting our values today, because people are indeed part of nature. We may quibble with how Pinchot or his successors have attempted to manage nature, but at least they are acknowledging that it's part. <laughs> I grew up in Boston. I was a big Larry Bird fan. This month has been really tough for me overall. Um, and Bird and Magic Johnson weren't enemies. They were rivals. And they had different talents, different philosophies. But the combination of those talents led to success of basketball. And so my view of Muir and Pinchot was really aided when I came to see them as rivals 
rather than enemies. They could promote the common cause of, um, of public lands uh, in the same way that, that Magic and Bird did. Although when we put their heads on, we see, uh, of course, that these were two old white men, which is a, a whole other topic that we don't really have room for. <laughs> um, so again, in 1896 at, uh, at Lake McDonald, the, um, the public domain uh, was under threat. There was some debate that maybe we shouldn't even let any people onto public lands. Um, and Muir and Pinchot were part of the National Forest Commission, which, uh, which was trying to solve those issues and led to a sort of theory of public lands that was able to carry the day. Um, a couple of Charlie Russell pictures, because if there's one Montanan that we love as much as Norman McLean is Charlie Russell, um, Charlie Russell would, would portray conflict, and a new idea like public lands would have some conflict, as, um, uh, as Nate will talk about in terms of Bernard DeVoto. And of course, his, uh, Russell's famous painting of Indians discovering Lewis and Clark. Sometimes uh, white people tend to view these things only from white perspectives. And so where I've been talking about where did the idea of public lands come from, the other important question is where did the lands of public lands come from? And of course they came from indigenous lands and so Shane can talk a little bit about that. Um, and let me hand it off to Nate. Great. Right. Thanks, John. Um, you mentioned a bunch of things and um, one thing I want to jump on and then we'll go back for some presentations is show this picture of President Trump signing the, um, basically it was the largest environmental rollback in American history. We shrank the Bears Ears National Monument by I think 85%. Just recently, Interior Secretary Deb Holland, after uh, action by President Biden, they got rid of the order that shrank the monument and she announced that it would be co-managed by the tribes, the five tribes who've long lived down there and the National Park Service, which is what they do in Canyon de Chelly, by the way, the Navajo Nation shares it with the Park Service. My question is, is the Antiquities Act, which was the basis of these things, really just a political tool that any administration come in and change that quickly? I, I grew up thinking it was a more solid foundation, it was a more solid law. My understanding was that, you know, Congress, much like the declaration of war, Congress understands that its slow, deliberative process can't respond quickly to a crisis. So Congress gave the president the authority to declare war. It also gave the president the authority to protect large landscapes if they were on the verge of being industrially in invaded. Congress did not, as I understand, give the president the unilateral right to rescind those things. Congress reserved the right to do it, but the president can create it, Congress gave the president that. Congress did not give the president the authority to rescind that. So I know that there's still legal battles going through that. Um, you know, Biden reversing Trump's order has, you know, taken the heat off that for the moment. But that's those are still questions that are going to have to be solved in the courts. Um, Senator Marjorie, you want to say a few things? Well, <laughs> it's a prepared remark. I think that's like uh, since he's a politician, a I'm still political joke him, for though. sure. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I'm a lawyer, to add to, add to it. Uh, but, you know, I, I mean, I would say that, you know, on top of the Antiquities Act, you know, when we were going through, you know, um, you know prior to colonial times, um, you know, we had the president was granted the authority through the Constitution um, to enter into treaties uh, with tribes with the, the consent of the Senate, right? And, um, and that was, in, in my opinion, uh, another effort similar to the Antiquities Act. Um, but I really think it was a, an effort to, a longer term effort to displace, you know, our original uh, public land users uh, across the country, right? And, and I think the, you know, you mentioned um, a couple examples of what the Secretary of Interior is doing today and, and partnering and working with tribes. Um, and I think the, the mindset of, for so long has been like, well, let tribes, let us show you what we can do um, but my philosophy and, and thought is we've always been able to do it, and we've always we were doing it, uh, you know, pre Antiquities Act, you know, pre Treaty Era. But you know, we had Manifest Destiny, Doctrine of Discovery, and all of those things, um, all pushing for you know resources and, and agricultural and uh, you know farming lands as well, which is is what we what we saw across the across the nation and, and across the West. So I would say that um, for me, there's there's an overlap there, and, and I think a lot the policy there 
um, was to, you know, really uh, displace to take, in a lot of ways, lands that were already being treated as public lands. So I want each of you geniuses to help me out here. I was having a little trouble between my good angels and my bad angels. You know, climate change, we're all doomed. On the other hand, you know, humans are resilient. I, I got to have a reason to get out of bed. Do, can any one of you three give me some reason why climate change won't eventually be this force that is greater than anything we can do politically, greater than anything we can do? I mean, or is it, do we still have, is there still, you know, a window of hope there? Tim, that's above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, to bring it back to the idea of public lands, uh, sacred ground. Well, because these are democracies' yeah. lands. We, yeah. We can govern Correct. them and affect yeah. them. And, right. Co Correct. And, and you know, 25 percent of our oil comes from these public lands. Yeah. Uh, there can be, so obviously, less drilling, and there can be more reforestation. You know, the idea that Franklin Roosevelt brought about in the 1930s of the CCC planted three billion trees. There are things that public lands can be used for. Restoration, which we've talked about, uh, those things can start pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, storing it in tree fiber, in grass, uh, roots in the soil. So there are things that public lands can be doing. And as more people, you know, again, it's that base of democracy, it's that base of the pyramid. Uh, the more people that are aware of public lands and what they can do, what they can be used for, the resources that are on them that are available to help all of us, all people, if that gets utilized and there's more awareness of that, hopefully um, something can be done to mitigate the effects of climate change. I, I mean, I think it's part of the solution, but it's not solely the answer. I think, obviously, the answer is incumbent upon us to, to do better, um, to you know, become carbon neutral and, and do better as people. Um, I, of course, I think all of those things that Nate just mentioned are a really important piece of it. But um, you know, it's it's you know, it, it's a dark question because right. in your in the back of your mind too, you know, it's like, are we are we too far along? Are we is it too late? Right? I mean, there are um, people who say. Why bring children into this world right now? I've heard that question. Yeah, and, and it's, I think it's a fair question. You know, I think it's uh, um, until we see, you know, some true massive changes in this, in this our country um, and across the world, you know, I think that's a, a fair assessment for people to continue to do. But yeah, I mean, obviously it's a very loaded question with a lot of different pieces. Um, but I obviously think that, you know, public lands play a really important role in that. Um, and, you know, one thing I'll, I'll just lastly say is, you know, for CSKT, I always thought for the Salish and Kootenai tribes when we um, fought so hard for our, our, our water rights for fisheries, that in my mind I always kind of thought of that as like, hey, we're actually trying to save fish for people, for the people in perpetuity, both Indian and non-Indian. Uh, protecting the water quality and the temperatures and water, and people don't even realize it, right? Like, we're, we're sitting here trying to um, preserve and protect a public resource um, for people, um, yet, you know, there's still always this, this fight to, you know, for, for you know, and, and I really try hard not to use the word greed, but, um, you know, I think people just have this mentality and it's shifted, I feel, over, even stronger over time that this is mine and, and this is mine only, um, and I'll take it until I, I, I kill the planet, right? And I just think um, that mentality is, is, seems, at least in my lifetime, I, I do know who Magic Johnson and Larry Bird are. I'm still part of that generation. But, um, you know, I, I feel like even in my lifetime, that mentality, I feel like in recent politics, it just seemed more evident. You've made my better angel go into hiding right now. <laughs> um, John, you want to jump in? Yeah, actually, I've got a unusual take on this, um, as much as I agree with, with, with what you guys are saying, and as much as I love democracy, the other big force that governs our lives is capitalism. And uh, I have a, my, my day job is writing for consulting firms and high-tech companies, uh, and we are seeing a lot of demand from companies, how do I become more sustainable? How do I reduce my carbon footprint? Because my customers and my uh, shareholders and my funders are demanding it. And so, you know, we often focus on democracy because we can vote. Um, and yet at the same time, when we buy things, that is a form of voting. That is a set of institutions that must respond to our values as individuals. And so, although capitalism did a lot to help create this crisis, 
it may be possible for capitalism to help us solve this crisis. And so I've now shifted all of my paying work to focusing more on those sustainability so how would actions. So how would you assess what a company like Patagonia does? Um, yeah, you know, Patagonia is responding to its customers who value these things. Mm -hmm. And I think what's, what, what gets me out of bed every morning is hoping that more companies will start to adopt Patagonia's values as they see that those are profitable. You know, as, as much as Patagonia does uh, in terms of making grants to, uh, to environmental organizations, they do so because they make money. Um, and I think other companies will look at that and say, well, gosh, maybe we could make money too by supporting the environment. Well, they led the charge against the Bears Ears rollback. A lot of other right. companies were surprised how quickly they got out with ads saying this is a horrible thing, this is a huge rollback. They, they were very political about it. And you're right, it's because they sell more T-shirts. I right. mean, ultimately, right. Right. I mean, that's what right. it is, right. but it's responding to the base. And, and, and I think, you know, we as, as journalists and activists, we tend to focus on the political realm of that, and oh, Patagonia took a political stand. But I think there's a more holistic view of getting in touch with your customers' values in general, and whether or not a company makes a political stand, if they can reduce their carbon footprint, they will help us in this fight against global warming. Well, so we, we do have to talk about politics briefly here. Uh, Nate, I'm gonna go to you because you've got Montana values. And even though you live in Brooklyn, <laughs> uh, tell us why, well, two, this two-part question, and all of you can jump on this later. The first part is, what do you see right now as the biggest political threat in the state of Montana to public lands and things we value? And secondly, use this, if you want, as a jumping-off point to tell us why the man you wrote about and his wife should matter 60 years or 70 years after his death. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that lead up, Tim. And I will, do I turn this on like that? I think it was already on. Oh, was it already on? Hopefully. Oh, I just turned it off. Um, I think probably the biggest uh, threat might be, the one that concerns me the most is talk about changing the Montana Constitution, which has, you know, one of the best preambles, uh, some of the best environmental protections. But I will cue you into why um, you know, why Montana might have been a state that could write a constitution like that. So I'll tell you a little bit about my book, This America of Ours, Bernard and Avis DeVoto and the Forgotten Fight to Save the Wild. So I use the word forgotten. By a show of hands, I'm curious how many people here are familiar at all with Bernard DeVoto. Oh, that's fabulous. I'm, I'm psyched to learn that. Uh, what about his wife, Avis, who is a little bit more prominent in pop culture right now? Any Avis DeVoto? Okay, we have some Avis DeVoto fans. It is very appropriate that the DeVotos uh, are so, there are so many devotees here because uh, this is kind of a spiritual home. This part of Western Montana is kind of a spiritual home for the DeVotos. If you drive over Lolo Pass, you go right by the Devoto Memorial Cedar Grove. So with the short amount of time allotted me, I will tell you a little bit about why the Devotos are so honored on public lands for the role they played in saving our public lands. This is the Devotos on their honeymoon, 1923. Avis is from the northern peninsula of Michigan, home of a lot of fine Montana conservationists. Now, Bernard is from Ogden, Utah. They met at Northwestern University. They bonded over their love of books. They wanted to create books. Avis as a genius editor, Bernard as a prolific writer. By the 1930s, they were finding success. They were at work on a trilogy of American Western history that would win a Pulitzer Prize and a National Book Award. Bernard was also a very fine columnist and cultural critic. Harper's Magazine hired him in 1935 to write a monthly column. By the 1940s, the Devotos were settled in Cambridge, Massachusetts with their two sons, and Bernard was planning a trip of a lifetime to take his family on the Lewis and Clark Trail all the way to the Pacific Ocean, visiting national parks so that he could write about public lands conservation. And that route put him on a collision course with the Devotos' great nemesis, Nevada Senator Pat McCarran. We were talking about origin myths. Pat McCarran's contribution to public lands is attacking public lands. He spent the 1930s defunding an agency that Franklin Roosevelt started called the Grazing Service. The Grazing Service was created to fight the Dust Bowl. 
Pat McCarran fought the grazing service, not only by defunding it, by, but by dismissing the plurality of its supporters. These were small ranchers, hikers, Native Americans, hunters, anglers, municipal water suppliers, irrigation farmers. By the 1940s, Pat McCarran was calling them disloyal to America possibly communists. In the 1950s, that ideology was picked up on by McCarran's great friend and ally, Joe McCarthy, who saw Pat McCarran as an American hero and a role model. You don't get McCarthyism without its true architect, Pat McCarran. 1946, Pat McCarran has so defunded the grazing service that it is reorganized into the agency we know now as the Bureau of Land Management, which Ed Abbey would soon deride as the Bureau of Livestock and Mining, which is exactly what McCarran wanted. So, 1946, the devoters pile in their Buick and they head west. And they're having a fantastic time learning their history, seeing their public lands, but they start to think something bad is happening when they reach the Dakotas and they see the beginnings of the Garrison Dam. The Garrison Dam is going to flood out around 150,000 acres of the homelands of the Mandan, Hadatsa, and Arikara nations. The Devotos thought that this type of Native American dispossession was a thing of the past, of the 1800s. They are outraged to see that it is still happening in the mid-1900s. And they know from history that the biggest public land scams, the biggest public land frauds went hand in hand with these natural resource bonanzas, these boom times in the West. So they start to think maybe something else is being cooked up. And it's in the Range Riders Cafe in Miles City, Montana that Bernard DeVoto eavesdrops on a quote, very loud and very drunk cattleman that he gets his confirmation that yes, there is an attack coming on public lands, that the same methods that Pat McCarran used against the grazing service are now going to be used against the National Forest Service and the National Park Service. So the devotos transform into investigative journalists and they start networking their way across the West. In Great Falls, Montana, they meet with Joseph Kinsey Howard, who's in the Montana Journalism Hall of Fame. His portrait hangs on the J School wall over at UM. In Yosemite, they meet with Ansel Adams. They ask, do you know anything about this plot? The devotos think if they can get the exact details of this plot, they can expose it and they can stop it. They meet with their old friend Wallace Stegner. But it is in Devoto's hometown of Ogden, Utah, that they get their big break. They meet with Chet Olson, a Forest Service ranger. And Chet Olson knows about a secret meeting that McCarran is going to preside over. At that meeting, there is produced a transcript of the whole meeting. Everything in this plot is laid out in this transcript. Olson manages to get his hands on one, and he gives it to Bernard Devoto. What Devoto reads sets his stubby hair on fire. The plan is this, <laughs> to take every acre under the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Land Management, transfer it to states, and sell it off, around 150 million acres. And then to go into the national forests and to liquidate as many as 75% of the acres inside national forests, and then repeat the process inside national parks and monuments. Devoto calls it a land grab, the biggest in U.S. history. And he blows it, up, blows it up, he exposes it in the January 1947 issue of Harper's Magazine. He titles it The West Against Itself. The reference is to politicians like McCarran, who for short-term political gain and quick cash will liquidate the natural resources of the West, which is to say the future of the West. Come 1950, that land grab plot has evolved. It had been to attack public lands at the extremities, starting with the BLM lands. Now they want to go for the heart, the most protected public lands, the national parks. The plan is to build dams inside national parks. There's plans ready to go to build dams in the Grand Canyon, Yellowstone, the North Fork of the Flathead, Kings Canyon, Mammoth Cave, and it's all going to start with a dam built in Dinosaur National Monument, which is on the border of Utah and Colorado. Once again, Devoto exposes it. He puts it in the Saturday Evening Post, the most read magazine of its era. He titles it, Shall We Let Them Ruin Our National Parks? And he lets everybody know that behind all the iterations of this land grab plot is Pat McCarran. So what happens when Bernard DeVoto exposes what Pat McCarran is up to? It gets Bernard attacked, of course, by McCarran's understudy, Joe McCarthy. But where Pat McCarran is a genius, 
when Joe McCarthy tries to attack Bernard DeVoto on Nationwide TV, he calls him... Richard DeVoto. The audio worked. If you didn't catch that, he goes on Nationwide TV and tells America they need to be scared of Richard DeVoto. <laughs> Richard DeVoto. Oh, there it is again. All right. um, but McCarran's not, or Mac McCarthy and McCarran are not done. You can see that when McCarran gets fan mail, it comes with stickers that say, I'm for McCarthy. McCarthy starts attacking these magazines that publish Bernard DeVoto, and he starts to get blacklisted. And this is bad for conservation because the DeVotos are the most eloquent spokespeople for conservation. It's also bad for the DeVoto family because this is their livelihood. Fortunately, Bernard has Avis. They start working together closer than ever before, brainstorming new ideas that they can write about in compensation for his getting blacklisted. Avis suggests that Bernard write about kitchen knives. He does so in Harper's Magazine, and in 1952, it gets him a fan letter from an aspiring cookbook chef living in Paris, <laughs> Julia Child. Avis and Julia become best friends. Avis promises she's gonna get Julia a book deal. She's gonna make her a star. And it's really sweet because uh, Julia, as she gets to know the devotos better, becomes a very outspoken person about public lands conservation in her own right. She calls it the public lands business. Um, so Julia Child was not the only new fan and friend that came into the devotos life because of conservation. Hopefully this plays. Maybe you can help me out with this. Uh, okay. This logger is going to tell you who this is. This is in the Bitterroot Mountains, 1954. I'll be goddamned. I never thought I'd see Adley Stevenson here. <laughs> Bernard DeVoto made a secret trip to Missoula, Montana in 1954 with Adley Stevenson, the Democratic nominee for president in 1952 and 1956. Stevenson asked DeVoto for a field lesson in conservation. So they go up to the Bitterroot Mountains. Bernard shows Stevenson how to chain smoke. He shows him conservation. <laughs> they go to ranges. Grass holds the soil. Friends. This is grassroots politics. <laughs> it is said that if Stevenson is president, Bernard DeVoto is going to be made the Secretary of Agriculture or the Secretary of the Interior to oversee public lands. You see Stevenson saying, yeah. Um, but Bernard impresses on Stevenson that one of the most important reasons for public lands conservation is to protect the sources of cold, clean water upon which life in the West depends. He tries fly fishing. You see how much he likes it. But Bernard is thinking ahead, just in case. By the way, this video is making the, its theatrical debut right here, right now. It's been in archives for around 70 years. Um, Bernard DeVoto is thinking ahead in case Stevenson is not the person to get his conservation ideas into the White House. He's also keeping up a robust conservation correspondence with his senator, John F. Kennedy. But that's all in the future. It's 1955. McCarthyism is bearing down on both of the DeVotos and what they want to do. How do they make Julia Child a star? How do they keep dams out of national parks? How do they do that? Friends, I wish I could tell you the answer right now, but I am out of time. I can only leave you with <laughs> my book. <laughs> my book, Bernard and Avis DeVoto and the Forgotten Fight to Save the Wild, comes out on July 5th. I have book plates I can sign if you pre-order one. There's some postcards for pre-order back Where'd there. Go, Nate? Thank you for your kind. <laughs> Thank you, Missoula. It's great Yay. to be back. Well, you brought him back to life. <laughs> Brilliant. I was just going to remind people that his book is out in a little more than a week on July 5th. So put it on your 4th of July list. So our time's getting short. I, I think we're going to take some audience questions. Um, do we have a, a roving mic in there? If, if not, you'll, you'll have to project. Roving mic to the right over there? Is that right? You don't see it? Um, Sorry, I'm so captivated. Questions? There's the mic. Yeah. Okay. okay, folks. Questions? Thank you. Um, hi, that was a great panel discussion. I wanted to ask you, all of you, uh, in paraphrasing Garrett Hardin, all these public lands, are we facing another tragedy of the commons by having so many people use the public lands that we're actually going to, as somebody said before, love them to death? And how do we avoid that? We have so many people moving to the West and more and more over time. How do we avoid this new tragedy of the commons? Senator? Um, well, first off, 
I would say one thing I've learned is uh, from Nate just now is that, you know, leave you in suspense so you'll buy the book. I'll leave you in suspense so you'll vote for me in the upcoming election if you're, if you're in my, my district. Um, but, uh, you know, honestly, I think that's a really good question. I think it, it goes back to your question earlier, right, of, you know, what's the biggest threat to, to public lands? And, um, you know, I think partially it, it is capitalism in, in a sense. And I also think it, it is, uh, uh, we've seen, a, you know, nothing like we've ever seen before where people are coming into Montana and buying up lands that we would uh, typically see multi-use, um, uh, allowing public use. And I think we have to start thinking outside the box to um, continue those efforts, such as like block management, um, opportunities for people to, to use those lands, and um, really push those massive ranch holders, um, you know, hobby ranchers that, that come into Montana, maybe not call them hobby ranchers to start with, but uh, <laughs> try and find partnerships with them to expand uses so that we don't run into that issue. I will defer to Mr. Egan, but I mean, you have written about how you admire like the land use in Italy, where they've got these gorgeous mountains, but they also have these very big cities. And somehow uh, a country like Italy has figured out how to have large populations, but also large, beautiful, wild, protected spaces. And that something like that might, if Westerners are enlightened, someday be a feature of the US West as well. Yeah, I mean, I lived in Italy for a while, and one of the things I noticed was that there wasn't a lot of public land. Um, but I will say this, that where I, the part where I lived, which was in the Chianti region, it looked the same as it did as in a Botticelli painting a thousand years earlier, or 500 years earlier. And the reason was that it was a community value. Everyone, rich and poor, newcomers and 10th generations, realized that having that olive grove there for 500 years, having that, those Chianti, you know, they've been growing, making wine there for almost 2,000 years, was, was a core value. And even though the Italians routinely violate almost any law and don't follow any law, <laughs> let alone pay any taxes, um, they really would get up in arms if someone tried to come in and put a Walmart in or you know, fence off a large section. So it's, it's an interesting thing. They don't have the public land value we have, but they have the culture value. And it goes to what you said. I, I do want to just wedge in, if I can, on what you raised, Senator. Do the Ted Turner ranches of Montana, I mean, is that, how do you guys view that? I mean, that's private land. Ted's, oh, look, I'm a good environmentalist, I'm putting bison on, but there isn't a lot of access either. So how do we view those giant private holdings? Yeah, I mean, when we think of capitalism, we think of, you know, trying to think outside the box. And I, I don't know the answer right now, and some, many of you, I see former law professors that I have in here and stuff too, so, um, you know, didn't talk about taxes in, in that particular class, but uh, I would say, you know, we have to start thinking of ways to incentivize those landowners. Um, you know, we've, we've thought of things like, you know, elk tags, um, certain types of tags, um, uses for them, um, but oftentimes it's not enough, and we, we have to start thinking of, of larger scale. How can we incentivize um, those large land-based um, holders to, to open up public lands for, for the public to use when they're not really being utilized other than, than you know, sitting there. And I would also say another big avenue is partnering with tribes, right? I think um, what I, I've seen in my recent experience is organizations um, partnering more with tribes. You know, I gave the example of fisheries and protecting um, waters and fisheries. We had lots of partners in, you know, restoring the bison range. Um, we have lots of partners in um, getting our water rights um, settled. Uh, we couldn't have done it without them, right? And I think a lot of organizations recognize the value in, in tribal treaties and protecting our natural resources. And so I think that's a, an opportunity that we've utilized, but I think it could be utilized um, more. T Tim, I think your question gets us back to, to where we started, yeah. that uh, public lands are democracy's lands. Public lands do so many wonderful things for us and our spiritual values. But we tend to think of public lands as nature's lands. Public lands are the ways to solve our environmental problems. I think if we can let go of that a little bit and say, well, public lands are great for democracy, but if, if our main priority is to address climate change, then we can do that through private lands. We can do that with Ted Turner. We can do that with the American Prairie Reserve, you know, hugely controversial, but probably one of the most fascinating stories in Montana right now. Can we use private lands 
to help address environmental problems. They need not be a public land issue. Um, other questions? Well, um, I guess I'll take that since everybody looked at me. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you know, how do we pass along indigenous knowledge? You know, the, the bison range is a classic example of, of that work, right? Like the tribes um, have a, had that restored. It was a place that had, you know, a lot of, um, you know, as I explained earlier, um, it was taken, but it also had bison that our, our people had brought across the divide and, and um, had the, you know, vision to protect and preserve. But what we've done there is we've revitalized it, rejuvenated it in a way that it tells our story. Um, it, it, you know, our visitor center now uh, tells our story of, of bison, our cultural connection. And the big piece of all of that too is that we now have our, our youth coming in, um, you know, both Indian and non-Indian in our schools to learn about our, our native community, um, learning about the culture and um, learning our language, right? Like there's so many things tied to our lands and our resources that are tied both to our, our religion, our culture, and our language. And so now kids can go there and, and learn those things. So that's something we have to continue to do more of in Montana. And I think also in Montana, we've, we've made many efforts um, over the years in the state legislature um, to obviously protect Indian Ed for All, um, finding ways to um, incorporate and change you know, uh, racist uh, place names and those sorts of things. And so those are all ways to, to spark positive conversations. Um, and to work with your local community, like Missoula County has been an incredible uh, partner to work with with CSKT and um, working with us to tell stories and put up signage in different places. You can walk through the entire city now, you can go to the library and learn about the CSKT. And those are efforts that we should be continuously doing um, both on uh, um, elsewhere and on state public lands and federal public lands. I think there was a question in the front here, if I'm not usurping Uh, John mentioned uh, public lands as places to enjoy nature, and I wonder if you'd comment uh, on the conflict between those who view public lands as places to enjoy nature with a minimum of infrastructure and no commercialism, and those who see public lands as amusement parks and uh, public lands and, and water as places for motorized recreation. Well, you've got the panel for that. Nate, you want to start? I would defer to John Clayton on that. I would only say that, you know, once again, it's a it's kind of a political answer. Maybe you can give me some pointers later, Shane. But, you know, as much as I love uh, places that have no uh, trace of industrialization whatsoever or no trace of, of, of use whatsoever, uh, human use particularly, uh, I am realizing more and more that it is the tension between all of those conflicting interests that keeps public lands ultimately safe. Because if there are people that want to build dams, but there are also people that want to run trees and also people that want to catch native fish, if they're all sort of competing against each other, that is a bulwark against you know, uh, political movements coming in and saying, well, let's just sell it off and have it be only one, one of those things. I, I, I hope Tim, Tim would agree. It was really easy for Gifford Pinchot. The, all he had to do was balance today's cut of trees versus tomorrow's. Today we have so many competing uses for public lands in terms of uh, timber, oil, uh, dams, motorized recreation, non-motorized recreation, and wildlife. We know, we know so much more about ecosystems than we did 120 years ago. How do we balance not only motorized and non-motorized, but all of these competing values on public lands? 
that is ultimately a political question. That is a question that we have to sort out through our elected representatives, through meaningful, constructive dialogue. Um, and so uh, I'm glad, Shane, that you're going to hopefully be part of that. And actually, Shane is uh, offered to close this out. Our time, unfortunately, is near, and Shane's going to wrap this up. Great. Well, um, adding to that, I would, th I th would say, you know, we have the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act is a classic example of, you know, diverse stakeholders coming together. And I think, you know, there's some folks who aren't happy about some of those various uses, but I, I, in my experience, we're more successful when we're, we have everybody at the table and we're trying to strike a balance, right? Um, and I think we're gonna be more successful in conserving our public lands um, and growing them if we have that, those diverse stakeholders at the table um, talking about these multiple uh, uses um, to strike that balance. And I think you know, we can look to some of the examples like that, um, which I think uh, has been really you know, worked on very heavily and a lot of you know, um, input and thought has went into that. Um, not perfect, but I think it's, it's, it's a place to, to start, to look, and, and to build off of. Thank you, panel. Thank you. Mr. Egan. Thank you.